This is the Power Up in America podcast, and today we're talking with the 63 kilo world champion Meg Scanlon, just six weeks out from Worlds in Malta. We talked about her big year in 2022, where she put over 40 kilos on her total in eight months, how she won Worlds without her biggest weapon, competing sick at nationals, and a lot more. Meg has an amazing story that inspires everyone who hears it, so I hope that you enjoy this one. Before we start, don't forget that we have three big events coming up in the next six weeks with Bench World starting May 20 in South Africa, Sub Junior, Junior Master, and Equip Nationals starting June 2nd in Arizona, and Classic Open World starting June 11th in Malta. All of these events will be streamed live and we'll post the links on our Instagram story at powerthing underscore America. So make sure you're following us. Thank you to SPD and Elenco for the continued partnership with Powerthing America. If you're looking to compete in drug tests of Powerthing, whether you're just starting out or you want to compete with the best in the world, make sure that you go to powerthing-america.com and become a member. Now, let's get to this interview with the world champion, Meg Scanlon. Okay, we've got the 63 kilo world champion, Meg Scanlon. Welcome to the Powerthing America podcast. How's it going, Meg? Going well. How are things going with you uh, in general right now? Like, give us a quick little update. Like, how's life for Meg Scanlon these days? You know, it's going pretty well, Paul. Uh, no complaints. You know, it's getting warmer. I'm on the East Coast, so it's been a long winter. Starting <laughs> to see some sun. Um, and I think anyone that lives in the Northeast just understands, like, it makes a big difference. Everything feels better, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Life feels better. Training feels better. And looking forward to, you know, more of that. Cool. So life is generally good then, huh? Mm-hmm. No complaints. Cool. So let's get into some stuff. We got some breaking news. Um, Celine Crum has decided to come on over to Powerlifting America. And as we've seen, you know, she's weighed in at 63, under 63 kilos, pretty much, I think, at her, her last three meets or so, um, even beyond that, her last four meets. So ostensibly she'll be your biggest challenger next year at PA Nats. And so just mm -hmm. what do you, how did you take the news that she's coming over and um, what do you think about it? I mean, I think it's great. I, I always wondered like when she was going to come over, like I never, and I don't think I ever asked her, but I never really thought it would be an if I kind of just felt like, Hey, I wonder when she's going to come over. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually didn't know until I think, the post about it that she qualified for junior world. Is that right? Like back um, in the day. Oh like yeah. I know exactly. she's not a junior anymore, yes. but yeah, yeah like yeah, that yeah. COVID year maybe. Mm -hmm. Um, I didn't even realize that either. And had I known that I would have thought more of, Oh, it's going to be an F you know what I mean? Like yeah. when is it going to happen type of deal? Mm -hmm. Um, so I think it's great. I think the more competition, the better. I love some competition. Um, I can't wait to be the underdog and be a comeback story again. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> you you will but, never be the underdog, I don't think. I mean, um, I guess not I'm anytime like almost, soon. <laughs> that's fair, but I feel like I feel like all of my my lifting career, I've always, in some way or another, been an underdog, and it will happen again because I'm getting older. Um, you know, and then it's going to be like, oh well, she's not young anymore. Can she still add kilos to her total? type of deal. But where I'm at now, I am still adding kilos to my total. So I think that I'm in a good spot for a while, you know, for 100%, you know, you know, I believe in you, um, for <laughs> sure. <laughs> um, but I do think it's like, it's one of these things like you didn't come to PA to avoid the challenge. You know no. what I mean? Like, obviously, mm -hmm. especially in your decision to move up to 63, you're sure. you, at the time in particular, it was yes. by far the most competitive weight class in the world. I mean, um, with the strongest yeah. lifters in the world, with the biggest Absolutely. outliers in the world. So you were running face first into the competition at the world level. So um, there's no, you were never ducking a challenge or anything like that. No, I 100% um, I made my decision to come over to PA for the opportunity to compete at Worlds again. Um, yeah. When I saw that that was going to be an opportunity, I knew like my decision was pretty clear, you know, on what I was going to do and where I was going to compete. Um, I knew the first year because of the timeline that it would probably not be a ton of competition, but I, I knew eventually there yeah. would be more and more competition. And you're seeing that happen. You start yeah. happen this year and it's going to happen next year and it will continue to happen. Um, yeah. So kind of like the same thing with Celine. Like I didn't necessarily think it was like a, if she'll come over, but more of a win type of deal. I think that that will be the same for a lot of different weight classes and competitors too. So I think like, Hey, Celine's coming over. That's fantastic. Like, let's go have a great 63 clash, but like, let's get some other 63s over here too. Like I love a good challenge. Yeah. You know, like I want to be challenged. That's how people get better. 
Yeah. And I mean, PA Nats is soon. I mean, it's this year was already like way more stacked, um, mm-hmm. even with a lot of, you know, our, our world's team athletes um, being at Sheffield and everything. There was there was more battles. It was more stacked. There's more depth. Um, the sessions were loaded with you mm-hmm. know amazing contenders, even if they weren't all in the same weight classes, stuff like that. So it's going to start to be a situation where PA Nats becomes um, one of the best and most competitive competitions of the year, you know, to tune in. Mm-hmm. And watch. So that's yeah. awesome. And do you know, Celine? Have you met? I do not know, like not in person, you know, like only from Instagram. I know Mm -hmm. Selena. (laughs) So I've never met her before. Um, The first nat, like the last nationals I did before the split, she did not go to her first nationals was the one after. So like, we've never met each other in person. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Mm -hmm. Well, let's wish her a warm welcome to power team America. And uh, we'll (laughs) look forward to seeing those battles in the future. Um, (laughs) But uh, another current event topic is, Sheffield, did you watch Mm -hmm. and what did you think? What's your, what's your reaction to it? So I was in Australia when Sheffield happened. I did watch live at, started at 2 a.m. in the morning. I would between events, like fall asleep and wake up to (laughs) Ryan yelling in the microphone. (laughs) I'm like, oh, okay, it's time for bench. Um, It was a late night. Uh, I thought it was fantastic. It was really cool. I liked the format of it because although it was still like, head on head it was still straight up like you had to hit certain numbers so like you saw people push when they wouldn't necessarily um and then obviously the atmosphere you could just tell it was sick yeah you know um I think it's a great thing for the sport and like it's exciting to see kind of what happens absolutely I mean I think it really like I've been I've been talking about it on every one of these episodes because it's just like I actually I'm just getting goosebumps thinking about Sheffield again just thinking the stage and Mm-hmm. And, and and I think I what I would keep saying is just like you all are superstars in in like in my in my mind in my eyes um and this was the first time when when the athletes were re- actually treated like superstars you know and like mm-hmm. actually like wind and dine like put up like put do media beforehand like like any other um, right. mainstream star athletes like you have so much media stuff to do leading up to big competitions after big competitions things like this and then just being on like a stage, like a rock star, you know, which right. I, like you guys are all like rock stars to me. So it's like, it just makes, it's just fitting that finally, you know, you're on this stage. And then like, I know with world games, they've kind of had that a little bit already. And on the equip side, like this last year, it was in Birmingham and I watched it and it was in a very similar type of uh, venue as Sheffield. Mm-hmm. It wasn't quite as theatrical. They didn't quite have the lighting and, and stuff as cool. And, and the video boards as cool as what what SBD did with Sheffield, right. but still similar concept, you know, and like that, that kind of like, you're an Olympic athlete now, staying yeah. in an Olympic village, you know, right. with the athlete, other athletes of other sports and stuff. And I, I just, I want that for our sport so bad. So it's so cool. Do you know what blew my mind? And this is probably, you know, like something that people gloss over is the warm up room, like mm-hmm. head spotters and motors. Yes. <laughs> the platforms in the warm up room. Um, so like coaches work coaches Mm -hmm. and like that's it you know so it was like like that's something that's so you know I mean it's big manpower but like something in terms of thinking of for a need of that size it's like wow what a great idea that was you know just in terms of like the athlete touch like of like you're saying like you feel so important Mm -hmm. you know Mm -hmm. like in the actual me day experience that's like such a it's yeah. a big thing, but like a small thing. Do you know what I yeah. mean? That it like, is. It wow, is. Wow, it's the not whole a sexy thing. Of the meat yeah, yeah, that's a good yeah. way of putting it. Yeah, it's not like super sexy. Like the lighting and stuff is like in the stage and the, yeah. and like the tiered seating and stuff. But it is one of those touches that yeah. is sort of like this should just be standard. Like especially for like prime time sessions. Obviously, if you have if you're doing meets with like four platforms and stuff, it's not possible. But right. but like in Austin um we it damn near could have been possible because we only had like five i think five warm-up platforms maybe six um and especially like for your session in austin it was right. just one flight like we easily could have right. done something like that you in some ways you know everyone kind of helps out and stuff and so it's like not yeah. like athletes are ever really loading their own plates anyway um right. but just that sort of like white glove service yeah i love that right? that's, yeah that's a really good point um for sure and yeah, there's a lot of little concepts and stuff that we can take from Sheffield and then make them standard going forward, mm. Mm. you know? Um, so I like that. What about the performances? Any performances stand out 
that you were just like shocked with? Um, I mean, Jesus' performance was absurd. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like yeah. literally just like out of this world absurd. Um, then I also think what was incredible was it was either the top, was it all top, was it top seven female broke the world record up to was, like number seven, I think. Or eight. I think it was, the it was eight. A, yeah. 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 That's insane. Like yeah. insane to think about. And even that it happened. You know, and I guess that's kind of what I mean by like, yes, it, everyone was competing against each other, but you also had a very clear set of numbers you were competing against at this meet. So yeah. like where you might not go for something in like a strategic meet where you're competing in the same weight class as someone on your yeah. second attempt, people were going for it, you know, because mm -hmm. they were like, this is the world record, like load it up, you know, and yeah. that's, that was really, really cool to see. Um, and I think because of that, you saw some really cool things come out of it, you know, because of how the actual meet was scored, um, and ran, um, mm -hmm. I mean, obviously Evie like shocked the world. Right. Yeah, and yeah. why? Because she figured out how this meet was going to, and her coach figured out like how this meet was going to be scored and ran and like went for it. Yep. Right. If it was not for this, would she have went for it to go 50, 52? Probably not. Yeah, right. Like I, eh, I was a 52. I went to 57. I'm still competitive as a 57. Like, why am I going to cut back? Mm -hmm. Well, if you have an opportunity to possibly chip all these world records and come out on top and win a fair amount of money, like 30 maybe, grand. Yeah. yeah, maybe, maybe 30 grand is enough to convince you to try, you know, yeah. like, and it's also like your, the risk, the risk reward, like, her, yeah. the risk for her to do that was pretty low because people were projecting her to be in one of the bottom spots. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, so her reward was huge. Yeah. If yeah. it goes well, yeah. I could be first or second. Right. So mm -hmm. like to see that played out on paper, like that was something that I was like, Whoa, this is so cool because yeah. I didn't see it coming. <laughs> Absolutely. No one did. Um, there was like a so... few, a few whispers and stuff before, but I mean, yeah, like there's basically nobody saw that coming. And then, like oh. you said, she, her and her coach, they looked and they saw the strategy. Mm -hmm. They looked at the numbers, they crunched the numbers and they say, look, there's opportunity to win this whole thing here. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. they came in and executed, which is the hard part. Right. It's easy to find. Okay. It looks like the 52 mm -hmm. world record might be a little bit of an outlier yeah. and maybe we could get it, but then actually show up, cut down and then go nine for nine. Um, and she, on the women's side, only three lifters, I believe went nine for nine, her, Amanda and Bonica. And, yeah. um, you know, and then Jesus was the only yeah. other one that went nine for nine. So, yeah. I, and I think after she took that first spot, I was like, oh, she looks good. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you got for someone that's cutting, at least you write yeah. down a weight class You're on the first lift. You're going to kind of be like, oh, or, oh, you know, like yeah. how did it go type of deal? Um, but I always like to see someone take a risk and it play out, you know, yeah. because yeah. that's, and sometimes like, that's what it's about. Like, just have some fun with it. Take the risk. You only live once. <laughs> totally. I mean, she totaled 460 at 52, yeah, which is, insane. that's pretty crazy, insane. right? I mean, did you yeah. ever think like you were 57 before, um, mm -hmm. and you have, you have totaled, you know, like, uh, around that as a 57 in the past, like mm -hmm. in 20, like, so just crazy to think the progress the sport is making Yeah. now 52 is crazy. Doing. I know. Yeah. Well, when I competed as a 57, my biggest total was at world and yeah. it was 478, right? Uh, I'm looking, <laughs> is this the one in Sweden? Yeah. 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 Your total is 471. Damn it. 471. All right. Fine. 471. Yeah. But how crazy is this? 471. I think Maria beat me by half a kilo or a kilo. I don't remember exactly. 472. Uh -huh. Those were like uh -huh. world records. Now we're over 500. Yeah. That's four years later three years later yeah that's insane yeah natalie and and uh jod and all they're all going up into the five teens you, you know? know like that's a lot in a short period of time that's this cool. sport is crazy this sport is crazy um but i mean your your total also has like skyrocketed right along with the rest of powerlifting so um but yeah any so did you get any kind of wild ideas from evie <laughs> <laughs> I'm <just gonna> <laughs> if I'm going anywhere, I'm just going to keep going up. Uh, no, I did not get any wild ideas from Evie. I am okay, way too muscular to try to get down to 57 anymore. Good. 
good. good. That's what I like to hear. <laughs> I think you're settling nicely in the 63s and um, that's your weight class. You know, that's what you'll be known for in history is a 63. Yeah, I think going 57, similarly, obviously it was very different. It wasn't Sheffield, but when I went 57, um, the first time, like at, at a, to go to nationals and to go to worlds, like it was, I took a risk on myself because I thought at that point in time, I could beat the 57s in the U S and then go to worlds and have a chance at winning as a 57. And I thought I could get there. Um, as a 63, I was very competitive already within the 63 class, but I did not think I would win. And at the mm. time I thought this might be my only chance because I want to have kids soon. So let's go to 57. It was a risk, mm -hmm. but it worked, you know, yeah, um, yeah. I didn't end up winning worlds, but I came close to like my goal of doing it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I'm going to pull up the uh, world's 2019 results because I know we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, let's before we go too far back in time, let's go with the the meat that's like the freshest in all of our minds, which is PA Nats. Mm -hmm. I know mm -hmm. you did. I know you did like a tune up meet in Australia as well. Um, oh, yeah. Even Forgot more recently. That. I mean, that was you're very competing. Fun. Yeah, you're, you're back on your compete all the time mode. Um, yeah, which, I want to say, though, because like, I don't want people to think to compete all the time because it's not responsible but yeah. like i also and i and i'm a proponent of this to my athletes as well mm -hmm. for instance australia like just you can have a day of training right like yeah. go have a, a meet and take it as a training day so mm -hmm. i competed and then i finished my training session in the back you know like that. it was a heavy day yeah so yeah. like if you just want to go and practice competing that's okay you know yeah. if you're someone that cuts don't cut Mm -hmm. take it as a heavy training day and finish the rest of your day. Like that's cool. You know, or for me, yeah. I wanted to do it obviously like for the experience, like I'm in Australia, it was at the, the gym that my coach owned. Yeah. So like, yeah, of course I want to do it, but I'm going to do it in a responsible way <laughs> and then mm -hmm. get the job done and finish my training uh, type of deal. Did you do, did you plan that trip around that meet as well? Or did it just happen to line up that they were doing a meet you had already planned on coming out that week? So I actually went to Australia because my husband wanted me to go. So for Christmas, he's like, you're going to Australia. And yeah. he actually had texted with my coach Kelly before me knowing any of this. Um, and like basically planned it with her that I would come out that week. And then the, the, that weekend would be the meet. So they okay. both knew and I didn't know <laughs> that's awesome. that I was going to come out and I was going to do the meet. Yeah, yeah. that's cool. Cause I know, I mean, I had talked to you several times in past and and I'm obviously in the DMs with Kelly and everything as well that you guys have never actually met in person. So this was like your no. first, what a yeah. cool thing. Like, man, Brian is a badass. Like, like what a good husband, man. Like I, I love <laughs> that guy. And, um, like, you, you know, just, here's another example of just an amazing story that he's kind of like orchestrated behind the scenes to just like yeah. give you a fun trip where you don't have to worry about traveling overseas with kids mm -hmm. and stuff and meet your yeah. coach and, do a little meet, but that's a really good point too, of like, um, just, just doing a tune up meet and, and using it as just practice for commands for things like how the reps are going to call it. Um, the meet in October that Waskar did to qualify for PA yep. Nats, he did the same thing. Um, yep. he put up a really big total, um, actually mm -hmm. a pretty, pretty big total that day, but he, after squat, he's in the back hitting his right. back downs. And then after bench, yep. he's in the back hitting his back downs. And then yep. I think, I think on deadlift, he, he, um, was like, I think he's, he had to leave and he's like, ah, I'll just do these tomorrow, but still, <laughs> still, I mean, right. but he, yeah. he, he also put up a big total, like a, a pretty big total as well. I think he mm -hmm. actually hit the like Carpino qualifying total for, for the U S national team at that meet as a tune-up. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Especially if you're newer to the sport. Like sometimes I think that we think, right. We always have to, we can only do a meet if we're going to PR, right. Yeah. But yeah. like, that's not the reality. If you're new, it's going to happen for a while, but after a while, it's not the reality. And there is a skill to competing as well. Even yeah. just like knowing the flow, the warm ups. every meet's going to be a little bit different, like learning oh. how to be adaptable. Like mm -hmm. these are all important things, right? Like judging is always going to be different. So even just going through and like, if you, ha if there's a meet where like a bunch of your friends are competing and just doing it for the actual meet and the skill of competing, like you don't have to plan out a PR every meet that you exactly. have. Yeah, exactly. Um, and yeah, like talking about like learning things, um, Bill Clayton is our technical chairman and he's on the technical committee of the IPF as well. And he's been d involved in powerlifting since like the eighties or maybe even mm -hmm. before. And I remember, um, I was at a meet with him in Panama and we he was like, 
he was telling me just that every meet you see something that you've never seen before and something yeah. new. And so, mm-hmm. so that's one of those things where just showing up and being there, being, you know, going through the whole weigh in process and then like being on the platform and watching the other competitors, watching the board and stuff like this, you're going to learn little things here and there. You're going to, you never know what you might learn from doing a meet like that. Yeah. And it's true. Cause in training, we can control everything, right? Like before yeah. training, what we like to do before training, like yeah. when we like to eat before training and it's, and a meet, you can to a degree, but you're going to be dictated by some things. You're going to have to weigh yeah. in two hours before. You're going to have a two hour window that you got to eat and warm up and whatever. So, anyway. Totally. No, it's yeah. a good, that's a uh, good point. All right. So let's uh, take them back to Austin this year. Um, okay. Where you put up a smooth little 520. Um, it wasn't that smooth. <laughs> smooth? <laughs> it wasn't that smooth. <laughs> Were you watching the meet? <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, it's hard for me to watch anything, but um, but yeah. Um, uh, so tell us about the meet and how, uh, you know, let's kind of recap it uh, real quick. And um, yeah, tell us how it went. Um, so, okay. The meet itself didn't necessarily go as planned. Probably any part of the day did not go as planned. Um, not much of the month before when it's planned, but you know, you take it, you take that, you win some, you lose some type of deal. Yeah. Um, so I had very good training leading up to nationals, which I think was the only part that made it like a dagger. You know what I mean? Like when you're like on a roll training and then yeah. you're like, all right, like this is happening. Um, but I ended up getting like pretty sick leading into nationals, um, which made my peaking block incredibly difficult. Um, I made it through it pretty well. Um, like I knew I should be okay numbers wise, but it was like very, very challenging. Um, and while I was definitely feeling better by the time I got to nationals and knew I was not going to make any, I, <laughs> what else sick, I kept announcing it. I felt so bad. Yeah. Whatever was going on, like whether it was the adrenaline, so like my heart rate's higher, the combination of like the chalk and the, and the, um, you know, like baby powder in the air. I could not stop coughing. Yeah. You were scaring me. I was like, she's going to die. A duck, first of all, but I felt like I was having an asthma attack. And I was like, guys, I swear to God, like, I don't have COVID. I've been tested for everything. Like I've been on antibiotics. Like I don't have anything that is going to be contagious, but I can't stop. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I was like, Meg just got the entire room sick. I was just like, I know <laughs> you were coughing. That's like- what I, I felt so bad. Um, oh, but yeah. I knew, I swear to God, like I knew I wasn't contagious, but I yeah. did feel like I was having an asthma attack in the back. And I was like, this is not, this is not okay. I definitely um, noticed it. So that was unfortunate. Um, it was unfortunate leading in like for the peaking block. And it was obviously unfortunate on me day. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that definitely affected me a little bit. And then there was some outside factors that also like in terms of stress like affected me immediately on that day that were like unforeseen um type of deal um and I didn't necessarily know what was going on I just knew like something had happened so like it was like this thing moving over my head you know what I mean when you're like all right I feel like something bad has happened but I don't know what it is and I didn't want to ask I knew it wasn't bad enough that Brian told me so I was like all right it's not bad enough he told me I'm not gonna ask but I was like what is it (laughs) Yeah, you're curious now. Day. Now you're like, now I'm thinking about it. Peaked curiosity. So the combination of the two things definitely led me to be a little bit like mentally not there. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you can see that in my squats, um, for sure. Like I took 190 as my second, and it was a grinder. Um, and it like shouldn't have been based on yeah. my training or my warm ups, or to be honest, even my first attempt. <laughs> yeah, like all moved well. Um. And then I, I just decided not to take my third at all, um, okay. just to scratch my third, um, because I felt like it wasn't worth it at that point in time, mm-hmm. um, based on how I was feeling and the numbers I knew I had to hit. Um, yeah. Bench, so you wanted to, you wanted to kind of like preserve some of your strength and kind of preserve, you know, not, not go through an all out grinder again, because your second was a kind of a grind and then obviously even going up any at all after that would have been just draining. Yeah. And I felt like at that point in time, I was deadlift had really gone well in training. Um, and not that I want to rely on the deadlift all the time, but, uh, I was like, all right, well, how are they going to feel like, you know, in terms of energy wise, like how am I going to feel when I got there type of deal? Um, and I wanted to have enough to be able to throw something, whatever I needed on the bar essentially Mm -hmm. at the end. Um, 
So who, who yeah. was calling, who was calling your numbers for you? Um, was it just Brian or was Kelly like watching the stream or something or? Yeah. Kelly was watching the stream and Brian. Um, okay. And I mean, I definitely will put my say into some of it. Like I, I said after my second squat that I don't want to take a third. Yeah. Um, I think that's the first time I've ever said that in my life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but you know, I've learned a lot from competing for so many years and it just wasn't something that was worth it for me, um, at mm-hmm. that point in time. Um, so yeah. So, so then going into the bench, um, you put up some numbers here. Now this was your first time with the new bench rules, right? Yeah. And so there's yeah. like a little bit and the previous meet that you did before this, you put up some wild bench numbers out in Brooklyn. Wild. Uh, it was sort of like the last, <laughs> the last run with your old bench. Yeah. Um, Good and so, so how did it feel then with the new bench coming sure. in and, you know, doing some numbers that are a little bit lower than what we normally expect from Meg Scanlon. And you can take a lot lower. Well, you know, I mean, it was like 20 kilos. That's a lot. Yeah. But you still did this. You still <laughs> finished with the same number that you did at worlds in South Africa. Because you that's missed two bitches there. <laughs> but that's because I didn't listen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because you didn't l- do very well on bench there either. But, but yeah. yeah. So, so tell us, tell us just like how was bench, how was the whole thing, you know, with the new rules and like, you know, where's it at? Yeah. So in Brooklyn, um, you know, I did, I did that meet for sure. Definitely because I wanted one last time to like have a little bench raw because I felt like after worlds, we really figured out what worked for my bench. The unfortunate part about that is obviously I knew I was going to have to change it. Like, I feel like I was the poster child for, Hey girl, you're borderline. You're going to have to change your bench. Yeah. Now in Brooklyn had a great, great benching day. Weights were flying then rolls around next day. I'm like, all right, I have to change my bench. Yeah. Um, and I had about, well, uh, 10 or 12 weeks ish to lead into mm-hmm. um, nationals. Mm-hmm. Now, the issue was I changed my bench a lot of different ways, starting with the most simple, obviously. And every which way I seemed to change my bench, I ended up being like, mm, looks borderline. I'd send it to so many different people, coaches, yeah. refs, whatever. And it's like, some people would be like, I think that's good. Some would say, no way. I would yeah. say like, eh, could go either way. I kept saying it all looks Personally, good. Personally, yeah, right? You're like, it looks good. You're great. I was like, it's perfect. Um, personally, I don't want to be on the, eh, it's borderline, especially mm-hmm. if you're trying to compete internationally, because if it's, eh, it's borderline, you're like, you're probably going to get red and go to the jury at least. Yeah. Um, like, it's just better to make sure it's a no doubter type of deal. Yeah. So I probably didn't find what was going to work for me bench wise and using quotations here um, until like maybe three weeks out, four weeks out from national. So it was like a pretty quick turnaround. Um, And then ironically, what we were doing ended up just murdering the right side of my upper body. Um, So uh, I was fine. Like I wasn't in pain, but like the, this happens with me a lot. If I have issues in bench, it's not necessarily that I'm in pain. It's like, um, almost like sub scat, but like my strength will just plummet. Like in the video, you can see of my bench, both my second and then the third, where I didn't end up getting it. My left side is okay. Like, Mm -hmm. it's almost like, all right, we're here. And my right side is like so far behind my left side. And it just like strength wise decreases. Um, so I made my second bench at nationals, which on my right side was very slow. And then I did not make my third, which I think was like 127 and a half. Yeah. Um, like on strength, you know, like I wasn't jumping commands. It was a strength issue. Mm-hmm. I left nationals. Like I walked out back and was like, this isn't the bench for me mm-hmm. because I saw no progression in it. Um, and it was like actually regressing. Cause I had hit, I think 130, like with a similar style, like in training. And then my strength started to like decrease because I, because of my right side. Yeah. Um, So what was the story with that right side thing? Like I actually have that exact same thing where my left side like pops super fast. It was always ahead of the Mm -hmm. right side, even though I'm right-handed and like my right arm is like stronger and stuff. So you find out like you said it's a sub scap kind of thing. Yeah. I definitely think it's a stat thing. Um, The issue why I was having such a bigger issue with it when I changed my bench. If you look at the bench in comparison, um, I changed my grip a bit. Obviously, I changed my arch a bit, but I also at nationals was flaring 
like a lot, like as much as I possibly could. And I just don't have that kind of like range of internal <laughs> rotation yeah. of my shoulder um, that it just didn't work for me. Like I have to be able to um, tuck my elbows a little bit. It doesn't have to be anything crazy, but a little bit. And that gives an illusion that you're not going as low, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. With your elbows when they're tucked. So that's why we started to flare. Um, since then, we've completely changed right back to <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah. So I've now seen... I'm on like my 17th iteration of bench, but I like it and it's staying and it's working. So it's, it's fine. looking good. <laughs> It's looking so good. So tell us the new bench is like a little bit of a sink. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to be a big boy now. I'm sinking. (laughs) Uh, You and Lugo. Exactly. I tell Lugo, I was like, yeah, can you teach me how to sink? Can I I be a big boy now? So I'm sinking. It was a learning curve, but I like it. It's working. My upper body feels great um, because I can tuck a little bit and still hit depth. Okay. I don't have to be in like an ultra flared position. Yeah. Yeah. It's looking so good. The only thing that I always think when I see sinking is, you know, obviously press command could be um, a little bit more questionable. It might be a little longer sometimes. I mean, just depends. And then the other thing is just if your butt comes off, because a lot of times yeah. when you go to press it off, you know, your butt will come off. Do you have either of those kind of, you know, do you have the, the, that, that problem? I don't want to jinx myself here. So I'm going to knock on wood. Knock on wood. Knock on one. I actually like it at my chest better. I never really liked soft touch at my chest, like waiting for okay. the press. Obviously, look at world. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, Good point. Can't get. You look at my history. Yeah, can't get much worse. Um, yeah. I was never completely comfortable with the bar at my chest, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I like it at my chest a little bit more with the sink. Like I'm not as a. I don't really care about waiting, right? Like mm-hmm. for the press command where I was trying to time it more before than waiting for the press mm-hmm. command, if that makes sense. Um, the butt for me, and this is a famous soft touch, is always for me where my feet are. If my feet are in the right position, I'm okay. If they're out of position, okay. that's where I have issues. Um, that was similar when I was doing soft touch as well. So it's just making sure like getting the reps and being consistent and repetitive with where my feet go. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right. And then one more thing about your bench is um, you know, like you said, you missed 127.5, but really like nine weeks earlier in Brooklyn, you opened with 130. So, yeah, I mean, so it, how did you mentally, that was rough. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. Very how do you mentally, exactly. Like, well, how do you yeah. mentally deal with this? Like, this is your weapon. This is what you're known yeah. for. You're, you're like a gold medalist, like with your opener and stuff, um, at worlds and whatnot. And so it's like, yeah, mentally, how did you overcome that? It's, yeah, it, it was rough. Um, I I never really thought of myself as a bencher, although I'm sure like everyone. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then my bench started getting even bigger, and I already had a big bench. Yeah. And then obviously in in Brooklyn, I put up some huge numbers on bench, so I almost felt as well, especially after that Brooklyn meet, that I almost became like the poster child of like this girl's gonna have to change her bench I wonder how much she's gonna lose she's probably gonna lose a lot because she's a huge cheater type of deal um you know what I mean like I was the poster girl for Instagram um and I did right like I did lose a lot um but it's also one of those things where I spent however many years six years learning how to bench one way right and over those six years improving my technique to a point where at the end the last six months of last year, like I would, I not to like toot my own horn, but like I had my technique pretty perfected, yeah. you know, where mm. like I could do it with my eyes closed, no question. And I could do it with heavy load. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Um, very comfortably. So having to change my technique was the first like huge learning curve. Cause it was almost like I'd never done it before. So we're mm-hmm. taking something that I felt completely competent at, com- like I was a pro at, and now I felt like I'd never done it before, but it was something I was supposed to be good at. So never even mind the numbers, like the movement itself. I felt like I'd never, <laughs> how am I ever going to be good at it again? You know, like I'd spent yeah. so long getting good at this one thing and now it's different. Um, the numbers were an and learning curve as well, because in training, I'm thinking of, well, I've been benching these numbers for the past year. So, you know, I'm training and I'm doing reps and I think that I should be in this range. 
And at first I was trying to, and it was an issue because I was gassing myself out. And then I was like, would hit failure. You know what I mean? Like run myself mm-hmm. into a wall essentially with fatigue. Um, so it took me a while to figure out what my training numbers should be for reps, you know, never, yeah. not even talking top end. Um, and I think sometimes it's similar to like comparing it to if you are competing and you're seeing success and maybe you have an injury and you're now you're training and you're not necessarily in pain, but there's a range you should be working in, but you're thinking about, well, I should be here. Like, this is where my strength is, even though I was benching a lot less than it. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, it's gotta be just mentally challenging. It, it throws your numbers into a wrench. Like, like that's something that probably people don't even think about is like, you with your old range of motion like you were doing i remember seeing like sets of eight and like with mm-hmm. huge huge amounts of weights and stuff and so in your frequency you know was was mm-hmm. like you were benching all the time mm-hmm. um and so i mean so many little things that have to change i don't think i mean you sound like right now you're you feel like you've got it really dialed and figured out and like you've you've got it set for malta but it's like I think we'll see, you know, after another whole year of doing this new bench technique, like come into Austin yes. next year for PA Nats and it'll be like, you'll be like right back up into these big numbers that you were doing like in Brooklyn and stuff and, or bigger than even than whatever you're going to do in Malta, which I'm sure is going to be a big number. Yeah. So I completely agree with you there. Like, I think in Malta, my badge is going to be way better than at nationals. Yeah. Like even just in terms of how it looks, like it looked like a struggle at nationals. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. it didn't look good. Mm-hmm. Um, that actually was something that going to Australia and being in person and being able to like, we focus on that, that week Okay. bench in particular was incredibly helpful. And at that you know, at the meet I did, I think I opened very similar, like we planned it very similar to nationals. I think I was like 120, 125, 127, but the difference in how it felt and moved in comparison to, I think it was three weeks earlier with a different technique was night and day. And I've been saying, um, a proponent of defending the big arch ventures and saying that that have more than a centimeter of range of motion, right? Like yeah. I had some range of motion, a couple of inches, at least before of like, we're still strong. It's just going to take a while. Like you're saying, just like yeah. in Malta, do I expect my bench to be bigger than at nationals? Yes. But do I expect it to be back where it was? No. Do I mm-hmm. expect in another year, it's going to be pretty close. Yeah. Cause I've had a whole year now yeah. to feel more confident feel like I'm a professional again, know what I'm doing every single time when I get down on that bench, like without a question with my eyes closed, I can touch whatever weight you throw on that bar. Yeah. Um, it takes time. And that's yeah, really hard when you're confined because world is in six weeks. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you're so mentally strong. Um, I think it comes from, you know, obviously you're, you're like an amazing athlete. You've gone through different kinds of sports and stuff. And so you know how to overcome and, you know, go through adversity and, and adapt and stuff like this, that, that high level athletes are supposed to do. So, but I think there are, you know, younger athletes, um, people that maybe are a little more insecure, um, you know, it, this would be devastating to have your bench. If you're known, you know, or if your bench is like one of your biggest lifts and one of your best mm-hmm. weapons. Um, I see people that I think r- will run from that challenge. And, and, you know, I I've actually have seen lifters that have come over to PA and tried to work with the new bench rules and have gone back, um, who have big yeah. arches and stuff like that. And they're just like, it's not worth it for me to be over here. Yeah. With this new bench I'm really sorry. Let no, no, no worries. I really fast. No worries. Um, <laughs> it's like you're mic'd up. We can still yeah. Cause you. I got closer. <laughs> um, yeah. I'll be honest, like that I could have ran, right? Yeah, like yeah, I'd be a perfect yeah. candidate, yeah. but it's just not in me. Like, it's not who I am. Um, like I know that it's the, the rule change is not to my benefit at all. Like yeah. I, I'm, I take a hit from it, but at the end of the day, I do believe that I have the strength where it's just a practice thing. Like I have to change and do something new and it's going to take a little while but I have the, the actual physical strength that once I figure it out and, and I'm able to practice that technique, like bench is going to play to my advantage again. I mean, yeah. I also know in saying that it's almost a funny thing because I still have one of the heaviest benches in the 63 class, yeah. even with decreased numbers, right? Totally. However, when we're talking total, the increased bench numbers help me. 
Of mm-hmm, course, mm-hmm, right? Yeah. So is that something where like anyone else, I want to have more kilos on my bench? Yeah. And I want to have them on my squat and my deadlift too, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but it is very, it's very challenging. It was very challenging. And I think right now I'm in a good spot with it, but there were many, many days where I did not enjoy training because of bench. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, I mean, this is what I love about getting you on here to talk about this stuff is like, you know, from the outside and obviously someone who's like a fanboy, um, you know, it's like, it's basically like, you think, wow, Meg is so strong. And she's like, so mentally strong that she's going to just take this massive hit on her, on her bench or something that she's mm-hmm. known for and everything like a big weapon. And then, but then to hear you say too, it's like, you struggle with it. You, you, there's days yeah. you don't like it. It's not all fun and games and that you just like set your mind, I'm going to do it. And then it's no. just all roses. Like you're still going through that process and just working through it. Yeah. It was really hard to go to nationals after benching 142, I think in Brooklyn yeah. and, and bench 125. And to be quite honest, like, I know, you know, this, cause I said it out loud. I was like, I don't want to take my third. Yeah, like yeah. bench I'd already scratched my third squat so I was like yeah. I like mentally g- to go out there and I knew like I am very good at knowing like hey this is a strength thing like it's not a technical thing like it yeah. was a strength thing on my second and so for me to get my third was very slim to go out and know that I was probably going to fail 127 and a half on strength because I had to change my bench was like a huge hit to my ego yeah <laughs> Um, but I did it and I survived (laughs) and you know, I'm intact and and my (laughs) ego's okay, but that's the only reason I didn't want to go out there. Let's be honest. Like bench doesn't really waste much energy. Like I couldn't say like I'm conserving energy. Whereas I do think it was a smart choice to not take my third squat. Um, I just didn't want to take it because I didn't want to have to fail 127 at nationals in front of people and take a hit to my ego. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that's what makes you Meg Scanlon is that you do it anyway. And you were in high spirits afterwards and everything. And, you know, I, uh, I don't know if it was that night or, or it was the next night after the Laco barbecue and all that. And so it's like, you, you brushed it off and handled it. Like that, that, I think it comes kind of back to the fact that you're a really well-rounded athlete, not just in powerlifting. And so the, in a lot of sports, when you have a bad performance, it's like, then you just have to brush it off and get ready for Mm -hmm. the next one. But with powerlifting, it's weird because we have, we only compete so infrequently. It's like, like your whole world is crashing around you. If you miss a 127 bench, you know, but obviously you, you had the ability to go out three weeks later and, and rectify, uh, you know, do a little bit better or whatever, but but still like we put so much more pressure because you only get these like nine attempts every six months. Um, yeah. so, but you, you I agree with that. I agree with that. And I think it's hard because people, you put so much into it, right. Leading yeah. up to those nine attempts, there is yeah. months of work and hours upon hours of work to lead up to those nine attempts rather than having a game every week. Um, I think that's part of the reason why I know we were talking about it early. Like I found a, a lot of enjoyment in doing meets, just like almost as training days, because yeah. in some way it allows me to relax a little bit more when I get two bigger meets, you know, like, mm-hmm. Hey, like this isn't a once every six months or twice a year that I have to come out only at nationals or worlds and try to hit something huge on the platform. Yeah. You know, like you can, not every day is going to be perfect. And at bigger meets, the likelihood of the days being perfect or even less, <laughs> um, mm-hmm. you know, as, both the pressure gets higher, um, and the stakes are higher and you're probably trying to hit something bigger. Um, and there's more travel involved and more competition involved, right? Like the odds are less that you're going to have those perfect days and you have to be able to be very competitive still be trying to hit those huge numbers, but be able to brush it off. If something goes wrong, like you have to move on and you have to move on pretty quickly or else it's, it's only going to end up hurting hurting yourself, you know, like as the day unfolds. It's amazing. You're, you're like super jacked and super strong, but I really think it might be your mental strength. That is, um, your biggest weapon now. Um, because like saying stuff like this, like we saw that you fought, battled through adversity at PA Nats still hit the qualifying total, which was a ridiculously high qualifying total. Um, and then, you know, we saw in South Africa, you battled through adversity and came out on top, became a world champion, brought home the gold medal. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's like, is bench the weapon or is it the brain is your weapon? I think it's probably, um, your mental strength is like, definitely you got that in your back pocket for sure. A card up your sleeve, an ACE card up your sleeve. 
hey, it's taken a long time, but yeah. at this point, I'm very, I'm very comfortable. You know, like yeah. I'm comfortable with myself as a competitor, and yeah. like I'm very comfortable on meet day and like asking certain things of myself that like I know I can do it. You know, yeah. um, even if everything's not perfect. And I remember the first nationals uh, in Austin. Um, I was like sitting and talking to you afterwards at the Laco Barbecue. And I think you had just competed that day or something. And I was like, how are you feeling? Are you feeling like, just like you got hit by a truck? Cause that's how a lot of people feel after yeah. eating. And you're like, no, I'm feeling good. I'm like ready to go. Like do, <laughs> do another meet. Like, so like, as far as doing frequently, like that really works for you because like you kind of come from this more like endurance sport background sure. and stuff where yeah. you're like, you're used to training, um, like that and stuff. So it's great for you. It might not be great for like Jesus or like someone in like the 100%. higher weight classes. No. You know? You works know, better and, if you're a lighter, a lighter male or yeah. female for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and you're just built different too. Like you have that different sort of, um, background where you were doing super total stuff in the past you've done like marathons and whatnot. And so it's like, you're just a different kind of athlete. So definitely listen to what she says. Don't necessarily listen to <laughs> what she does <laughs> based on what she does. But the key, the key of the competing is not to max out, yeah. which is really hard for people to not yeah. do. That's yeah. really, really hard, you yeah. know? Um, and it's even hard for me sometimes. Like, I'm like, oh, let's go. It's the like, crowds oh, okay, no, just behind kidding. you. Like, let's not go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So to wrap up uh, PA Nats this year, um, then let's go into deadlift. You know, so you went two for three on squat or really mm -hmm. two for two. And mm -hmm. then you went two for three on bench. And then boom, mm -hmm. three yeah. for three on deadlift. Back to back, right. back to back meets. That's right. So deadlift, man, it's just, you know, um, deadlift and me are friends now. It took a very long time mm -hmm. to become friends with deadlift and we're pretty tight. Um, I feel very, very confident with the numbers that I can throw on the barbell on deadlift, which is a great thing when you're approaching my deadlift bar. Um, and I knew at that point in time, like I do have a, a switch inside of me. <laughs> that can be like flipped for very short periods of time, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and it seemingly needs to happen on deadlift because that's the last lift in a powerlifting meet. So it kind of was like, this is, this is it. Like I'm all in, like, I'm going to hit the total. I was not leaving that room without hitting the total. Yeah. Um, and so we went through for three. I think I matched my deadlift at that point in time, like my deadlift PR, um, yeah. and it moved, it moved decent. So I was very happy with it. Yeah, it moved, moved um, fine. I mean, it definitely was not like, you know, it didn't look like an opener by any means, your final right. lift. Um, it looked like a real third attempt under pressure with something on the line, which I think right. is really cool that you kind of got that intense moment, even though there was really no other 63s challenging you or anything like that. It was going yeah. up against that qualifying total, which I believe was like 518 or 519 or it, it was something yeah, that five, was, 520 was the number you needed to hit if you weren't taking chips. Yeah. So the plan originally was to take a chip on my squat because then I wouldn't have had to use go up five, right? Because yeah, I had that yeah. in play um, because the American record before nationals was 187 and a half. So the plan was to use a chip on squat. But when I scratched my third, I also, you know, took that out of play for myself and had to go up a whole, you know, another two and a half, which didn't end up being a big deal. But um, I think it was 518.5. 518.5, yeah. Yeah. Well, I was didn't have necessarily have any head to head competition. Like for me, I, that was my competition. Yeah. Like I was going to hit that number. That's why I went to nationals. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. Yeah. I mean, like that's one thing that I thought was kind of cool. Like, um, because obviously this was like a cluster of a situation with Sheffield happening and, and mm -hmm. just like coming up with like, how to make uh, the the qualifying that's going to be best for the athletes, but also give Team USA the the best competitors so we can compete for the World Championships and stuff like this. And so it was it was like very uh, nerve wracking on on the PA side of things of like coming up with this formulas and and whatnot. But I think one of the kind of unforeseen consequences that was cool was that people who didn't have anyone in their weight class to really push them were still had to push themselves at nationals. Mm -hmm. So like you had to put on a show, even though you didn't really mm -hmm. have anyone nipping at your heels or anything like that. Um, mm -hmm. and so that was kind of cool. Like you couldn't, 
do like what happened at previous PA Nats where you could kind of just yes. take the dub and, and chill right. out and whatever. So it kind of made right. for much more entertaining performances. I agree. And I am not someone to like take the dub and move on. Yeah. Um, but on this specific day, how I felt, would I? Have? Yeah, yes. you would have. Yeah, I would have. Yeah. Um, yeah. and I, I mean, I don't say that lightly, but like I would have, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm just being honest, you know, um, no, so it definitely a, made me like push myself. This is like a gritty, uh, Michael Jordan playing with the flu, uh, <laughs> kind of performance that you put on here. And I, I just think it's so cool. Like now you have that experience. Like, so you know, uh, if you show up in Malta and suddenly you've got a, like a crazy cough, that sounds like you're going to die. It's like, yeah. who cares? We know you're still good for five twenty plus you know, um, she's so, dying, but she's fine. She's fine. You know, we, yeah. we know we've seen, we've been there, we've done that. So yeah. Um, very cool. Um, that your, your deadlift is really coming around. Um, that two Oh five moved pretty easy. And that was after, <clears throat> you know, you're sick, your training was derailed a little bit. Um, I think it, you, you also hit two Oh five in Brooklyn. And if my memory served right, it moved a little better over there. Um, I can't remember <clears throat> about the same. Yeah, probably about the same. Yeah. But that was with perfect training, everything feeling good. Oh yeah. No stress. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention was just that, you know, that Brooklyn meet, you went nine for nine and you haven't really been going nine for nine, um, at no. some of these other meets. I haven't screwed I'm... myself up in Australia. So you, did? you did. You yep. did. You see those yeah. results aren't on, aren't on here. So I can't. Oh, uh, okay. I went eight for um, nine, but it was a tech tech technical thing. I screwed up on and deadlift sad, but whatever. Isn't it just interesting though, that like, I, Cause I know that Brooklyn meet was kind of just like a, you know, last mm -hmm. victory lap with the bench press. Sure. Um, but still like things went really well on squat and really well on deadlift and just that whatever mindset you had going into that and like, let's go nine for nine and let's just chill. This meet is really irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. Let's just have a fun day, but by far your biggest total yeah. as well. So yeah. Yes. And also in Australia, like, I know you can't see the numbers and I probably don't know what they are on the top of my head, but, um, like yeah. I had a very good day, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, and it, they weren't max numbers, but, uh, they were all like sub max numbers, but I think I like hit 187 on my squat and like it moved, you know, where like mm -hmm. 190 is the most I've hit in competition. Um, so yes, it is something that I've definitely noticed and it is something that, um, I've oh. actually kind of like decided to like, this is just how I'm going to approach the meet in Malta <laughs> is how you did in Brooklyn is like, yeah. Or how like you did in every, Australia either, either one, you know, yeah. like the whole experience of it. Like, it's just, it's, it's a regular week training is normal and we have a meet at the end of it. You know what I mean? There happens mm -hmm. to be a meet at the end of the week. And like, I'm here to have fun, you know, like I've done yeah. what I wanted to do. Like I'm here to have fun. Um, yeah. Because whenever I do that, that's when I seem to have my best days. And yeah. where do you want to have your best days? You want to have your best days at Worlds. Um, totally. So yeah, it's actually something that I've I've like been working on. It's just in general, like kind of talking about what that would look like. With um, I work with a sports psychologist of like just like hey, like I've made this realization in general that these meets I perform the best at. And of course, you can say a ton of things like the pressure and whatever right of like yeah. worlds or nationals but at the same point in time like you can't really because like yeah at worlds last year like I wasn't really even predicted to be on the podium <laughs> you know like so mm -hmm. did I have a lot of pressure on me no I didn't the only pressure mm -hmm. I had on me was what I was putting on myself um type of deal um so it's just like the change in mindset around it you know, like yep. just because the meat is a bigger meat doesn't mean my mindset should change. It should actually stay the same because I'm seeing success when it is a certain way. And for me, it's a way where it's just a little bit lighter and like a little bit more fun. Mm -hmm. Um, a little less in grumpy. general. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, I'm, I'm pumped. I mean, this is what, this is what's so, I mean, you're, you're an OG in the game. Like you've been competing since 2016, according to open powerlifting is your first mm -hmm first competition. So you've been around forever. You've done a lot. I mean, you've been at the highest stage and stuff like this, but I just love your attitude. Like you're still learning. Like, like yeah. this is like a big revelation and you right. might not have found that out if you didn't do that meet in Brooklyn and right. do this meet in Australia, you know, and have a right. good time. And then now you've got this 
another little card up your sleeve for Malta that that mm-hmm. other lifters don't have, which is that mm-hmm. this ability to like be in the right headspace, you know, and stuff mm-hmm. like that. So mm-hmm. I'm I'm pumped. Like Meg Scanlon's like, you know, uh, we're just learning, you know. I mean, you're just the the future is bright, honestly. Like you're you're like a you you still have like a, a ton of upside and a ton of room to grow with all these things that you're learning and putting it on the platform. Um, and before we move on to like going into your backstory and whatnot, let's just say uh, 150, I'm going to put it out there. You're going to bench 150 <laughs> one day. Again. Oh, one day. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. You're going to bench 150. For sure. Yeah. Like I have some no. numbers in my mind, you know what yeah. I mean? Like lifetime. Yeah. And yeah. that's definitely one of my lifetime numbers without a yeah. doubt. Cause yeah. you did that 142.5 in Brooklyn. And I know like that would have been, I believe that would have been an unofficial world record, like a couple months prior, but the Corolla had done like 143.5 or something yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. like right there. And you had, I was yeah. so mad. I didn't throw 145 on the bar because it moves so fast. And I was like, this yeah. is the last chance. <laughs> yeah, And it moved. You, you definitely uh, had it, but whatever. Yeah. Um, it is. What it, hindsight's yeah. 2020. Cause you didn't it know. And, and also with that, bench technique as opposed to the new one um you there you hit a wall you, it's very hard to tell where the wall is you know very yeah yeah super small range of motion it's like, true yeah so. it's true it's true and you in if it the weight goes up a little bit it gets you a little bit out of position so like, yeah there's no grinding it yeah. just either is on or off yeah so all right so let's do like kind of a quick um recap of like your backstory and mm-hmm. let's take it back to let's start with um worlds in 2019 and uh mm-hmm. so this was your last hurrah as a 57 is that right or did you do more meets i had one more meet as a 57 even though i swore it off after worlds however yeah it Ron was Nats. um yeah ron Nats 20, 2021 it was right after i i had kids and at the time i went to 57 just because i lost so much muscle mass so like i was uh-huh. very small uh i mean i was very small then um so it just made sense, but any other time it doesn't make sense for me. to be <laughs> Yeah. So let's go back. Um, what happened in Sweden, 2019, this is the first time I had ever heard of you, or, I mean, I, I think I was following you before that, yeah. um, just kind of going into it. But, um, this was whenever it was like, you like kind of crash onto the scene as far as mm-hmm. like, I remember thinking you won as a world champ, you're a world champion at 57. And then tell us, tell us a story like through your eyes. Yeah. So it's funny. I, so 2019, I did my first meet in 2016. I think you said, right. Yeah. 2017 was my first raw nationals. Yeah. Let's make sense. Cause they're in the fall. Mm-hmm. So, or they were in the fall. So 2017, I did my first raw nationals as a 63. I was a pretty small 63. I think I weighed in at 61 or something. Like I wasn't 60. cutting weight. You 60 weighed in at 60. something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I had so much fun. Like I had no expectations. I had a lot of fun at the meet and I did pretty well. Like I think I came in fifth and yeah. I was like, huh, maybe I could be good at this sport, you know, wow. like at the time I was still running marathons and, um, like doing triathlons too. Yeah. Um, but obviously like I was doing them to compete with myself and not necessarily on a higher, higher scale or level. So that was the first time that I thought like, maybe there's something here. Um, and then soon after that, I also started weightlifting. Um, Olympic so, you know, normal. Yeah. Olympic weightlifting. So I was doing super total, <laughs> Um, and after the Arnold that year in 2018, um, I, it, I got an injury, so I got injured. So I had a, a little time off and like rebuilding. And I thought to myself, like, what do I really want out of this year? You know, like for powerlifting and topping on my list was obviously, and naturally for someone going to their, to their second Raw nationals was I want to win and I want to go to world. Cause that's awesome. normal. So how am I going to do that? <laughs> <laughs> and this was in 2018. So I started thinking and I thought, well, how I'm going to do that is I'm going to cut to 57 and I'm going to compete as a 57. Cause I think I can beat those numbers at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, so that is what I did. I had to cut and do a local meet, um, at 57 and I did. Yep. And then I went to raw nationals as a 57, um, in Spokane, probably saying that wrong still still can Spokane. Spokane. Yeah. Spokane. Spokane. Um, and that was my first, you know, nationals in 57. I did win. It was my second nationals in general, had a great meet in winter world in 2019. So, so you were Evie before Evie. That's what I'm saying. She's That's why I love the story. You just she's taking a, 
she she was like you know her coach is probably like hey they're yeah. like hey we did we're doing the research we're, we're pulling right. up the archives there's this woman in the u.s who did this thing no <laughs> <laughs> no but i was small 57 right like kind of how she sat in the middle of the yeah. 57 weight class i sat in the middle of the 63 weight class yeah and i was like it's not unreasonable to cut down at the time i wasn't as muscular like i was newer to powerlifting, right so like mm-hmm. i had a lot of muscle mass for an endurance athlete but I wasn't huge yet, yeah, like I yeah. am now, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, um, so it wasn't unreasonable. And, um, I thought, you know, I would be able to hit numbers that would win going into raw nationals. I was not favored to win. <laughs> um, I was still a newcomer. It was only my second nationals and, you know, they're going off of, she's a 63, she's cutting to 57 type of deal. Um, yeah. so like in my mind, my expectation was to win, but for everyone else, I do not think that was necessarily their expectation. Um, I did win um, and preparing for Worlds in 2019, I started obviously to gain muscle mass as one does when one can, one competes in a strength sport for several years. So yeah. now it's kind of like on year two and a half or whatever of powerlifting starting to gain muscle. Um, it got harder and harder to cut down to 57. Mm-hmm. Um, and so going into Sweden, I was still doing super gentle <laughs> too. Um, I knew I was going to have a big, like water cut. Yeah. Wait, real fast before we go, before we get yeah. into it, let, just tell people what super total is. Cause uh, there's probably a lot of people who don't know it, it. I don't know if this was a thing that was bigger in the past because it's d- doesn't, it's not very common at all really now. Yeah. I don't think it was bigger. I think I just like, was like, yeah, this is cool. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's very uncommon to be honest. Yeah. Um, so super total is competing in powerlifting and weightlifting. Um, and some people do it and they'll compete in meets at different times of the years. Like there's all different ways to do it. But okay. of course, when I did it, I was like, I'm going to figure out how to combine these things as much as possible. So the, in Atlanta, there used to be a cool five, they called it five bar. It was a super total meet, both sanctioned USAW, USAPL. There's a couple mm-hmm. more. Um, I would make the Arnold like a super total weekend. So I would do the weightlifting meet and the powerlifting meets that were there, that type of deal. Um, so naturally like going into worlds, I did a weightlifting meet two weeks out from worlds and then just, you know, to feel like it was a normal weekend and then went to worlds, um, and had a huge water cut, which I knew I was going to have. And that's why even going into worlds, I was like, this is my last time competing at 57. Like this is an an interesting Mm -hmm. to me type of deal, but I'm committed. Like I am going to world. Um, and so I did, and I weighed in and it was a rough start. One could say, uh, yeah, you missed your opening opening (laughs) squad. Yeah. Which, which in raw powerlifting, like I was talking with an equipped guy on the podcast. I saw that. Yeah. And it's just, I laughed and I commented on it and I was like, I can relate. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. (laughs) So you were probably uh, shitting yourself then is what basically. <laughs> kind of. So to put myself back in the frame of mind, I walked off the platform and was like, wow, I just wasted two years of my life. And I'm, I flew all the way to Sweden to miss my first squad and possibly bomb out of, of worlds. Great job, you know, and there's yeah. nothing you can do at that point in time, except like get up on the horse and ride it. So yeah. that's basically what I did. Um, I ended up like coming back. I made my second and my third squat and they were both grinders. Um, and then third was, I believe a world record because it's a weird number. It's 178. So I opened, which also take this for what you will. I opened on a world record squat, missed it, came back. The second one obviously was still a world record squat, made it. And then I think I added a kilo or a kilo and a half for my third. I don't remember exactly. This, um, this Matt Gary, this is not Matt Gary approved, um, attempt, <laughs> attempt selection here, uh, opening, trying to open with the world record and then only going up two kilos. Like you did a lot of work to pull out to work. get that 178. You took three very hard attempts to get I that did. 178. Um, yeah. so definitely not advice. Um, definitely don't want to do look, that. I've in- learned. Yeah. Yeah. See, like it comes full well, circle. Sometimes you got to learn it. Unfortunately it was at worlds, but I did learn. And who was calling those numbers? I mean, was it uh, Arian at that time or was it, were you kind of like the dictator telling them, Hey, these are the numbers or no, uh, I was, I, 
come on i'm like i don't have it in me to be addicted <laughs> okay well uh, who knows this no, was young I mean, this like, was young meg so i don't know <laughs> yeah this was young meg i mean here's the thing i i worked with a different coach at the time my training was going fantastically but yeah. obviously i had a huge cut um yeah. the only thing this is such a huge difference between me then and now is warming up like i you don't know how you're gonna feel after you have a huge cut sometimes you feel great and sometimes you don't it's just a hit or miss right yeah when i was warming up i knew i felt terrible but i i wasn't gonna voice that like gotcha. here i am at world do you know what i mean mm -hmm. um the only thing i wish i had at worlds was like and obviously you know brian's in the back with me a lot like yeah like someone that could voice it for me. Mm -hmm. um, someone who can be like, do you know what um, I mean? She's saying that she's all good, but she's not. I can tell. Yeah. yeah. And I say yeah. this to people because I think it's invaluable. Like as athletes and as you start to get to a higher level, like you're likely not going to voice that because this is what you trained for. Like mm -hmm. I worked the past two years for this moment. Like I'm yeah. not going to say I don't feel good. No one cares how you feel, <laughs> yeah. you know, <laughs> for better or worse. Um, but I, like sometimes I do need someone to save me from myself. Yeah. You're, you're trying to convince yourself that you feel yes, good and, exactly. and you can't let yourself admit that like, um, actually things are feeling like shit right now. Um, right. you don't want to even get those thoughts in your head. No. You're trying to get rid of them from your head. Um, it's yeah. kind of like, um, people have talked about Taylor Atwood at Sheffield, you know, like had food poisoning the day before. Mm -hmm. And, and I think there's a funny story where Jess Bittner saw him in the somewhere in the hotel and was and he was like how are you doing champ and he's like oh i'm great okay. everything's all good and then yeah. she just like walked away going like he yeah. looks like total shit right now right like, what? yes <laughs> yes yes and honestly the other reason why i think i learned this lesson hard was the saddest thing that happened at 2019 worlds was when was when ray bombed oh yeah yeah and he was sick yeah obviously he's Same. not cutting weight he was legitimately sick and lost mm -hmm. body weight right yeah. And it makes a big difference. Like there's things you can push through. Obviously mine was a water cut a little bit different. I'm starting to feel better as time goes on. Yeah. He's not starting to feel better as time goes on. Yeah. But like there's things you can push through and there's things that you can't. But sometimes when you're in a, you know, at the top level and you're pushing yourself and you're trying to complete a goal, like you're not going to admit to yourself or anyone else that you're not, you're not how you should be. Yeah. Um, and that's why you see sometimes things like that happen. Right. Yeah, I mean, you, you see, it's just it a reminder, sports. like everyone's human. Yeah. Really. It's, so, it's, this is so common for, for, for athletes, um, like quarterbacks, you know, get a concussion and they're just, or football players, you know, they get a concussion and mm -hmm. they're just like, no, I'm good to go. Put me back right. in, you know, like they're right. never going to say that's why they yeah. have to have these concussion protocols now, because it's like, mm -hmm. no athlete is ever going to be like, no, I'm not good. Like, right. Take me out coach. Right. Um, well, okay. So you hit a world record squat though, opened with it and then chipped it with, you know, yeah. by two kilos and then mm -hmm. come out on bench and you have a very cute little one Oh five, uh, opener here. <laughs> There's like little baby Meg numbers on bench. Baby Meg. Um, I but, did. Yeah, That's go ahead. To 57, but I also, no, no shit. I, it's awesome. I world, I hit a world record bench too. Yeah, I know. Exactly. Exactly. But it's just, it's just so like you, I'm looking at it. And it's like one Oh five opening, opening one thirty, um, <laughs> And I'm like, oh, only one twenty five. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah. So yeah. your bench was a weapon then as it is, as sure. it still is. I mean, your squat too. I mean, your world record squat three for three on bench world record bench with a, and these attempts look a lot more normal 105 110 115.5 mm -hmm. i mean just think about that the, your your jumps on bench are five kilos and then five and a half kilos mm -hmm. you, but on squat it was two kilos which yeah i was dying which, you know squat it should be like a lot more like 10 kilos after yeah. the open or something like that so um okay so bench went well tell us bench about went well. yeah um bench went well you know like that yeah. And bench has always been like up until national, <laughs> but bench has always been loyal to me. Like in yeah. terms of like, you know, people always say like, oh, my bench takes a huge hit when I cut weight. Cut. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, and that never really happened to me when I cut weight to 57. Um, it was always like very predictable as long as, you know, like it was feeling good in training. Um, it was easy to predict like what it would be like on the platform. And where were you at this point then? Were you in the lead? Yeah, 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 world yeah. record squat world record yeah. bench how could you not be? Yeah, yeah i was so i actually at the time my squat and maria's squat were very very close and i think she missed her third so i ended with a higher squat i ended with a higher bench 
um, I knew she had a bigger deadlift with me, like going into deadlift. Um, I was not yeah. a great deadlifter at yeah. all. Yeah. She did miss her third, um, squat. She had a 172 point. She got a 172.5 on the board and a 102.5 on bench. So mm -hmm. yeah, she's hanging around for, for, you had a pretty good lead. You had a damn good lead. Actually. I had a really, yeah, I did. I did. Sure did. So crazily enough, uh, I opened with a deadlift that had a total world record. I believe don't okay. quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure my, my first deadlift gave me a total world, like broke the total world record. <laughs> I made that, I made my second and then I missed my third. Okay. Yeah. So, but that's not where that's like the most least dramatic way of uh, telling the story though. Because, I know. Cause what happened? Cause but I opened a window that honestly, if there is a window, I cracked the window and Maria found a way to get through the crack and open the window. She it's like incredible to think about. And like, I think about this, even I know I've talked, you've said a lot about like mental strength and mentality, yeah. but never mind what she did physically. Like, it's really a mental thing that she did, mm -hmm. right? She, I don't know the numbers, but she went out on her second pull and missed it on grip, like dropped the bar. It wasn't like yeah. she locked it out and it slipped. She dropped the bar and she came back on her third and she had to throw like, I think 10 kilos on the bar, maybe. Yeah. So about. Yeah, yeah to, she opened, she opened 180, missed 190. Yeah. Then has to go to 197 in okay. order to beat you because yeah. actually she had a body weight advantage is, is it what's interesting. Um, so she actually, yeah, she had to take that number cause it wasn't a world record. So, and yeah. you did have, you had some chips. Oh, I play. got you. you had yeah. Some chips so she basically essentially grip is strength. Like she missed 190 on grip strength and then yeah. came back and hit seven and a half kilos more to win. Yeah. One of the most, dramatic moments in, it was very in, all dramatic. Of, in all of powerlifting. Um, I remember when she missed 190, I was watching this and this is like one of the, my first memories in, in watching a uh, live powerlifting. And I thought it's when she missed 190, I was like, that's the dub, you know, yeah. another world champion here for team USA. And then of course, you know, you missed, but you only mm -hmm. went up two and a half kilos. Anyway, you went from 177.5 to 180. Sure did. Um, but if you had hit seven and a half, it's very hard. <laughs> yeah. But, but like, I guess if you had hit that, she would have had to right. go up to go 200. 200. That would have been know? a huge ass. Yeah. yeah. That's what I mean. I cracked the window by missing my third. I didn't give up a huge amount of kilos. Um, I no. mean, two and a half at the end of the day, it was an incredible battle. Right. But at yeah. the end of the day, it was a huge PR total for me, um, at 57, mm -hmm. um, you know, I yeah. hit PRs kind of across the board. Like it wasn't, it was a great day for me. I just ended up on the wrong side of the coin, you know, two, two world records. I mean, yeah. and it just, it's just those little things that make you think about like, if your squat attempts had been a little different, if you opened a little bit lighter, would you have had that extra two and a half kilos on deadlift? I mean, obviously you can I was... tell you something. Okay. I, I've never thought about it that way. Oh, really? I've always okay. thought about it. Like it's on me. Like I should have, I should have done better with like my body weight. You know, like mm -hmm. I shouldn't have cut so much water because they're numbers that I should have hit, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, like based on my training. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, I guess it all kind of comes down to that cut, um, in your eyes. Yeah. And I, but, I get what you're saying. Right. Yeah. Cause like, I feel like a lot of people are like, that's how you're going to look at it. Um, yeah. and there's times that I've looked at it that way, but I think most times like, uh, like what could I have done differently? Cause I can't change that. Like you can never change your numbers once, once you decide, once they're there, right? Like you can quarterback yeah. chair, quarterback, you know, yeah, Monday, exactly. Monday morning, arms, quarterback, arms, chair, Monday yeah, morning quarter yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, and that's cool. Right. Like you can learn from that. Right. Yeah. Like, and I've definitely learned from that. If you've looked at future attempts, but how, like, what can I do differently? Right. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there were two options. It's either I'm going to change how I'm sitting day to day for my body weight, which would also mean changing how I train, like in terms of volume, because I was just building so much muscle mass. Um, or I can decide to move up a weight class. Yeah. And that's what you did. And that's what I did. And the rest is history. All right. Well, so I don't want to keep beating on this. And I know that had to be like, now it's been a while. So, you know, yeah. it had to be just like something that's like, you know, you could second guess it all day long. And think about this or that if maria t hadn't put on those wrist wraps 
Um, I've heard this story um, from on King of the Lifts a bunch of times because obviously she's Canadian. She's a hero for for, yeah. for everyone in Canada for coming out. Those rest wrapped, man. Yeah, like because to help her with her grip and even if it's yeah. just a mental thing or who knows, right. but it just just is a great. It's one of like those um, I think really big dramatic battles in the sport that everyone should know about. So that's why I just wanted to, I know you've told this story many times. On yeah, podcasts and stuff, I agree with you. And I, I totally agree with you. And I think that it is also another perfect example of like, you never know what's going to happen. Yeah. You just never know. And like, you have to be able to get over those little mental hurdles because nothing's ever going to go perfect. If she got yeah. caught up in that in losing that 190 in grip strength, she would have never pulled 197 and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Ever. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Um, so like the ability to move forward when things don't go your way is incredibly important to the, to success. Yeah. I mean, and, and that's what we've seen now, like, you know, that's been kind of the moral of this podcast. We've talked about, you know, um, the adversity that you've overcome, the adversity that Maria overcame there, you know? Mm-hmm. So yeah, very cool. All right. So let's, um, I don't want to keep you for, you know, I want to get through everything that we had planned to yeah, talk yeah. about here. So let's kind of give us, what happened after that? Okay. You're, you're okay. definitely deciding you're going to move up. You're going to yeah. have kids, you yep. know, tell us about that. And then like the yep. comeback, the comeback from there, um, you know, yep. kind of in like leading into PA Nats, the first PA yep. Nats. Yep. So I, um, my, the last meet I did before I got pregnant was the Arnold of COVID. <laughs> That's the best uh, way to describe it. Yeah. And I literally found out I was pregnant two weeks later. Um, And so I was like, all right, well, I'm going to take some time off, you know, like competing wise, I was still training. And it's funny. I remember talking to Pete Spence, uh, like a couple, couple weeks later. And I was like, well, you know, like lockdown's probably not going to last that long. Maybe I'll do like bench nationals or something, you know, like obviously I'll be pregnant, but like, who cares just for fun. And then obviously things lasted a lot longer than anyone ever, anyone ever expected. Um, so I had twin girls in November of 2020. Um, and didn't think I was going to really compete after that, (laughs) which is the irony of it all. Um, but I think just the, the situation of COVID of having newborn twins, um, of having a garage gym, like it was something that I could do that felt normal, right? Mm -hmm. Like once I could start working out again, and it was something that I could do that I knew exactly what I was doing during a time period where I felt like I had no idea what I was doing. Um, so it just started to, the ball started rolling. And once it started rolling, it started picking up speed. Um, so I did compete, um, at 2021 nationals went like six months postpartum. Um, which is kind of insane and something I never insane. thought I would do, but I did not as, a 57, as, as well. a 57, but because of COVID the qualifying totals, like they could be from farther back. So I didn't have to do a meet before that to qualify. Okay. Um, training was just, I was like linearly progressing and it was going well. So I was like, why not? You know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I did, I went down and I competed. Um, I didn't, I ended up getting hurt and had a, a meh day. I came in second and one would be like, Oh, the fire was lit. And honestly, the exact opposite thing happened. Um, I, after that, like kind of stepped away from powerlifting, I started doing more CrossFit type training. I was running, um, because I got hurt and I, I was just tired of being in pain. Like, yeah. um, squatting was hurting, deadlifting was hurting. And that's two thirds of a powerlifting meet. So, <laughs> um, I just wasn't willing to be in pain anymore. Um, and until I was, I figured out if I could do powerlifting without pain, I was just going to train in other ways. Um, Mm -hmm. because of that roundabout way, I found my current coach, um, now, um, Kelly, she had worked with a lifter on her squat because she was in pain and she became pain-free. And I said, maybe she can help me. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't even thinking about competing in powerlifting, started working with her and slowly but surely squat started feeling better deadlift started feeling better and they were not hurting anymore and this is a couple of months um and I still wasn't training for powerlifting I was just doing my own thing and doing like one-on-one sessions with her Mm -hmm. then like any rational human I was like well if it doesn't hurt I should do it again (laughs) so I did a meet um yeah just to see 
Yeah. Like test the waters. And I basically asked Kelly four weeks out if, if she would coach me for the meet. And if I could get through the meet and not be in pain and have fun with the process, like I would do PA Nats. And um, that's kind of what happened. Like that was like the meet where I fully enjoyed myself. Like yeah. I had such a fun time and I was like, I'm not in any pain at all. And I feel like there's more. And I hadn't felt like that in such a long, long time. And it was by far your biggest total. You went yeah. nine for nine. Mm -hmm. um, so again, like going into a meet with like no pressure and having fun right. and having a good day mm -hmm. comes out with a big performance of 495 total as, yep. as kind of like your debut as you know, in your new form. Um, mm -hmm. as a 63. And yep. so, yeah, I mean, and then, you know, the rest is history from there. We know what happens after that. Um, but I think it's just wild to think that like, because that meet was in December again, these yeah. December meets you do. I know in, it's a good time of year good, for me. Yeah. You I do like the good holiday season. <laughs> yeah. So, um, that meet was in December and then nationals was in April. So it was only like four months later. So you didn't right. have a huge amount of prep. You had only done a small, tiny prep, you know, kind of even leading into that meet. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just interesting to think about like how little like serious training and serious, like how much pressure you're putting on yourself leading into that first uh, PA Nats. It was like, you were, you were kind of like, I could take it or leave it with powerlifting um, until that yeah. state meet. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And then I was like, all right, let's, let's do this thing. Let's, let's run it back. Um, I think the, the pressure for me, um, going into PA Nats, I actually almost didn't, I forgot if I told you this, I almost didn't show up to PA Nats that year. Cause I like oh. hurt my rib, um, like randomly just like a random thing. And it like hurt to squat. So I ended up high bar squatting at PA Nats because <laughs> it didn't really hurt as much. Um, I did not even and, know that backstory. Yeah. So, which is fine. You know what I mean? But I think I put a lot of pressure on myself going into that PA Nats because I wanted to hit a respectable total because I didn't want um, people to think I was running away from competition. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. And I, I know you know what I mean um, in terms of my choices and I wanted to be able to go back to world. So, yeah, no. And, in, and you put up a 495, um, but with missing two attempts. Mm -hmm. um, so you basically kind of, you know, even with giving away two attempts, you right where you were at base state, you know, so yeah. that's, yeah. that's good. Yeah. Um, well, I love also like, it's interesting how COVID has like thrown us all onto like, I know like, a weird, weird bubble, weird trajectories and stuff, you yeah. know, like your path was going one way yep. COVID happened. Um, you said like you, you're a new mother. So that's like something that's like out of, you don't know what you're doing. Like you said, mm -mm. like, like any new parent would be, um, we, nobody knew what they were doing as far as COVID was concerned. Mm -mm. Right. Everyone yep. is like a totally new thing for all of us. And you were like, you said that you, you had the home gym, the garage gym, and that was like something you knew, like mm -hmm. fitness, that was something you right. knew you were good at. You could control with all this uncertainty in the world. Right. It was like, I've got a barbell, I've got a combo rack, I've got right. weights. I can go out right. there and like, I can, this is a little, uh, like little, um, you know, a little place, a little haven from all the chaos in the world mm -hmm. that where I can control and where I know I'm like good at something. Right. Um, I, that's crazy to think like maybe if COVID didn't happen, you would have just been like running marathons or like gone in a totally different path. I think about that a lot. Like I do not, if COVID didn't happen, I do not think I would have came back at least as quickly and, or to the level that I have come back to. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah. Like we wouldn't have a world champion in the 63 kilo weight class. Um, if it wasn't for crazy, COVID. right. I never, ever so, thought I would. Yeah. Crazy. crazy turn crazy turn of events all right so then um let's um we kind of talked about you know you know pa nats uh, round one was kind of uneventful so let's just fast forward to yeah south africa and yep. um, what all happened and went down there yeah so we know south the africa. story that it's like you know <laughs> we know the story that like the bus ride is you know a pain oh. in the, ass. the travel is a pain that you, you got you got like pulled over in your yeah. bus and stuff sure and, like, did. scary don't recommend <laughs> It, 10 out of 10, don't recommend. And Brian was there though. So yeah, he was even scared and he feeling, never gets scared. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He's a very confident guy. He doesn't get scared. Um, so that was crazy, but let's talk yeah, about the yeah. competition. Yeah. Um, yeah. So my goal 
um, I had two goals going into world. One was to allow myself to have the experience. I felt like I missed out on in Sweden. And by that, I don't mean like I performed well in Sweden, but I just mean, I, because I had such a huge water cut, it obviously affects your experience. Right. Um, and how you experience the totality of the meat in general, but also the meat itself. So I wanted to be able to like fully grasp that and like live in the moment of like, Hey, you're at world. Like, that's a big deal. Like that's something special. Um, yeah. And so like, that was goal number one. Obviously I didn't necessarily think it was going to have to happen after kids. So like, that was something else that was kind of special about returning to world. And then the second goal for me was to, I wanted to podium. Like I thought I had the opportunity to come in and take a podium spot. And I know I wasn't projected that way, but how my training was going, I thought that I had a, there, if I performed, I would have a chance. Um, so as the day unfolded, some doors and opportunities opened for me, um, that proved that maybe not only could I take a podium spot, but there was a chance I could win. Um, and obviously going into South Africa, that wasn't something I foresaw. Um, but it, yeah, it was kind of cool. I mean, mean, (laughs) like to be just totally honest, like yeah. I had you, I had you picked as second place. Um, right. and I think, I mean, there's no shame in saying that you're going against arguably the greatest power lifter, you know, in, 100%. Our, time, in our time right now in Leah Babwa. So, so yeah, yeah any I don't rational think human being would be <laughs> projected. Yeah. Right. So yeah. it's a funny thing. Cause like talking to people, even at the gym, I train at, they're like, Oh, you're going to world. And I'm like, yeah, they're like, Oh, you'll win. And I'm like, no, 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 no. That's not yeah. my goal. Like, I don't want yeah. you to think that, right? Like, this is my goal, root for my goal. You know, like I want to come in second or third. Like I want to take a podium spot. It's realistic. I should be able to do it if I take care of my side of things. Yeah. Cause that's all you can control. Like if I take care of my stuff, I'll be good type yeah. of deal. Um, so yeah, it was an interesting day. Like, I don't know why I have all these interesting days, but it was an interesting day for me. Um, <laughs> it was to, to say the least. <laughs> Yeah. I went two for three on squats. Um, which that was neither here nor there. Um, yeah. squats have been the final thing that have kind of come back for me postpartum. And that was almost a whole year ago. And at that time, the top end was much harder to predict. So it wasn't necessarily like, a, like, I don't think any of the calls were wrong. It was just uh, much more uh, of a shot than now when I take a squat, like I'm like, it's happening type of deal, you know? Um, so yeah, I went two for three on squats and then real quick on that. Is it postpartum (laughs) postpartum? Is it, I remember, I think I saw some story posts and things cause you're like people who aren't following you, like crawl out from under the rock that you're living under. (laughs) Um, because you post a lot of super useful information and Mm -hmm. there's a thing where I think that you were saying like, how did it affect you? Like you couldn't grind, like you couldn't push, you didn't feel like you had that full strength. Right. Yeah. So it's postpartum is going to be different for everybody, which is like one of the most challenging things. So it's not necessarily like, Oh, you had a baby. Like this is what we need to do to get you back here. There's a lot of like different experimentation. Um, for some people it's pelvic floor issues for me. It was, um, like my abs. (laughs) Um, I had a, like I twins. So my stomach was huge. First of all, um, I had a lot of abdominal separation. So my bracing wasn't nearly as effective as it was prior to having kids. Um, and like even bracing under heavier load for a while, I would have some like doming and coning, which doesn't really matter what it is outside of like, it's inefficient. Like you're not, you're not able to get as much pressure, right. Cause now you're leaking it. Think of like a hole in a cup, right? Like you're now leaking efficiency. Um, so once I got under a certain load, if your bracing isn't as efficient or effective, it's going to be very hard to grind through that load for any period of time where that used to be a skill of mine. Right. Uh, totally. Um, so that has been something that has taken a long time to not only like regain as much tension in my core to regain strength in my abdominals and to rework how I'm going to brace. Um, and that probably took like a year and a half to like really be confident in it. Um, and at that point I wasn't quite there yet. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, but you are now. yeah, that's honestly one reason I wasn't that mad that I had a grind on my second spot at powerlifting American Nationals this year. I was like, I can grind again. Yeah. 
that's cool yeah <laughs> even while thing, sick you know? even while sick and all that other stuff yeah like, you can still feel like hey this feels right now yes yeah all right cool so then take us into bench um your biggest weapon and you go one for three sure hit your that opener. Was a good day hit my opener and then i jumped commands twice okay so that's what it was it was just jumping the commands I have not jumped a command since my first powerlifting meet. And I jumped the press command, not once, but twice. Yeah. And you still Pretty won. Pretty shitty. You yeah, still I still won bench. Won bench by 50. Oh, actually no, I think by five, five, right? five kilos, yeah. five kilos yeah. over uh, Iris. Yeah. Yeah. So ideally we were projecting, like I would probably hit like 135, 137 on bench. And I ended up at 125. I only hit my opener. I missed my second. I missed my third. Um, not great showing uh, for me. So what to like, tell us like, how do you overcome something like that? Like they, because again, it's like, maybe you don't think of yourself as a bench specialist, but I'm watching this, like, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm actually watching the live stream and clipping it yep. and everything. And I'm thinking to myself, like, first of all, we're all high, you know, Mike actually called, like, was calling me like Leah didn't yeah. like, wait all this, right. you know, and it was right. like, get ready, right. you know? And, and then, so we're all like, Oh my God, like we're going to have a world right. champion. And then I'm like, and she's like going to win a gold medal on bench. And she's like huge bencher. And like, she's going to yeah. just run away from everyone on bench and put this out of reach. And right. then it's like, boom, you don't, you, yeah, you no. miss, you mm. miss. So obviously like the roller coaster of emotions for just guy watching. Yeah. <laughs> it was it's hard. A shitload. The roller coaster of emotions for me. How, how was it for uh, you? Yeah. And how did you Mike, Because warming up, he was like, are you sure about this bench opener? And I'm like, trust me, bench has been flying. Just watch. And they, it was flying. Like all of yeah. my warm ups flying. Yeah. Um, so uh, the platform is very slippery. Yeah. It is what it is. I've learned. Blocks. Did you use blocks or you? I didn't use blocks. Feet on the floor, platform very slippery. Um, and my feet were sliding, which is neither here nor there, but I could at the time not handle it mentally. <laughs> mm -hmm. And because of that, I missed calls, which is a key yeah. part of benching. Um, so, okay. so you were thinking about other stuff. Yeah. Um, and again, like you live and you learn, right? So like yeah. it is what it is. Um, and it's something that at the time, like, I, I can't tell you how much I probably for Mike and, and, and Rodney heard about my feet. I was like, they're sliding, they're sliding. My feet are sliding, they're moving. And they're like, okay, well, you're going to have to get over it. Um, yeah. and obviously I didn't get over it. Um, and the key there for me was not necessarily that I felt like I was a bench specialist, but that I knew I needed kilos on bench. If that makes sense, like yeah. for my total, um, and once bench was over, I just kind of felt like where I usually enjoy bench, like I couldn't wait for it to be over. Cause I couldn't get myself out of that cycle. Mm -hmm. Right. Of like mm -hmm. thinking about what I couldn't control. I couldn't control that. So like I had to move on from it type of deal. Um, and once bench was over, I felt like that was an opportunity for me to kind of step away and reset, um, and just like move forward. Um, I didn't think at that time, I necessarily still had an opportunity to win. I still thought I could definitely podium, but I didn't think I necessarily had an opportunity to win. Um, so that's literally what I did. I literally removed myself from the arena, like stepped away from it and kind of like had a talk with myself. Like, why are we here? Like, well, why are we here? What are we going to do? And like, what's your goal from here? Um, like I can let the one for three, like dictate my whole experience here, or I can come back and like, end this on a high note and do what I have to do. Yeah. And did you know, were you like watching the board? Did where's Mike and them, were they telling you like, Hey, you're still in first place right now. Like, and anything like that, you didn't know any of that. No, I didn't know any of that. So when I came back from the bathroom, mm -hmm. um, it's where I had the talk with myself. <laughs> nice. But when I came bathroom back, talks. Yeah, right. uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I wish I you were back, mic'd up. That would have been amazing. Could you imagine? <laughs> People are probably in the bathroom being like, what is this chick doing? Yeah. Um, when I came back, I remember Brian came up to me and just said, what do you think about opening at 190 for deadlift? And I said, do I have to? Like, that was my response. And he said, yes. And I said, all right, throw it on. You know, like, that's it. Uh -huh. Like, that's my decision. You're going to put uh -huh. it on the bar because that's why I came. Um, so anyways, him and Mike were talking, obviously, before while I was away. And, you know, like, do you? 
do you think she'll do this type of deal? Cause like, if she does this, it's going to put her in a really good position if she can move the bar well. Yeah. So 190 was a huge number for me to open at based on yeah. my past deadlifting numbers. <laughs> yeah. I mean, even after that, you have opened at 185. You yeah. typically were opening at more like in 177.5 was what you opened it at PA Nats round one. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, like the base state meet, you open 175. So yeah, this is a shit ton more than what you're used to opening. There's definitely some strategy going on here with big Mike. Definitely some strategy. So the yeah. only thing, and I knew that obviously, but the only thing I could think of in my head at that point in time, wasn't if I knew I could lift 190, but was like, I need to lift it and I need to make it look like an opener, like an opener. Yep. Like it needs to be believable that yeah. this is an opener, regardless of what happens after this, people yeah. need to believe this because they're going to make their jumps based off of what I'm doing. Yep. Yep. So I walked yeah. out and I heard Ryan, AKA King lift. And I've told him this too. I gave him some flag. Yeah. He was like, Oh, this is big. This is a big opener for her. This is really heavy. And I'm like, dude, <laughs> you can hear him about talking. To pull this. Yeah. It was that so, quiet in the room. Yeah, it was. And he's kind of close too. And obviously very animated, but yeah. I give her, I give him a hard time for her, but in reality, it was like, I loved it. I was like, Oh yeah. Like watch this. You know what I yeah. mean? Like just I can little, deadlift now. Yeah. That little extra chip right as you're mm -hmm. walking out just to fire you up. I like exactly, that. Exactly. Exactly. Cool. So we moved 190 well and made a 10 kilo jump to 200, which at that point in time was something I had not hit on a platform at least. Yep. I think I hit it once in training for a very, very slow single. Um, yeah. But you, you were used to 10 kilo jumps though, but yeah. Yeah. Um, so then I kind of told myself the same thing. Like I need to make this look like a second. Like I need to push people to where they're uncomfortable because I know that's why we're picking this number. <laughs> like I know, yeah. we're, you know, there's a reason this number is on the bar. Um, I think at the time I didn't ask them what I said, just put whatever you, need to put like strategy wise on the bar. Like, I don't want to know. So like, I didn't know 200 was on the bar until I was like walking out there type of deal. Um, I was just like, the only thing I had in my mind was like, I need to move it. Like I need to move it fast. Like make people believe like it's a second mm -hmm. type of deal. Um, so I took 200, moved it pretty well. Um, and then I think we went 205 for my third. Didn't mm -hmm. make 205 but pushed everyone enough that they also didn't make their third. Yeah, exactly. I'm looking at the uh, board here for that. And it's just all reds on thirds yeah. um, for like one through one through six. And that's kind of this chain, this domino effect that happens when the person who's projected to win yourself and everyone thinks you're going to win, you know, and you know, you bump your opener up kind of pushes right. everyone to where they're kind of taking seconds and thirds on their first and second, and then everyone misses their third. Yeah. It, Mike definitely is smart, pulled off a good strategy. Um, Kiara though, she only had to jump from 210 to two. She only had to take a two and a half kilo jump to 212. I know. And I remember in the moment thinking there's just no way that she's going to miss a two and a half kilo jump. Like there's just no way, you know? And I know she did. Behold, she did. I thought that watching the rerun, rerun, rerun as well, yeah. um, you know, in the moment, it's funny because in the moment, like I, and even thinking back, like, I feel like, like I should have been able to move 205 the way yeah. I moved 200, but it's also like, you can only move so much at top end, like 200 yeah. was a PR for me, <laughs> you yeah. know, like yeah. I opened very heavy for me. Like how many times am I going to like, whatever, move a certain load, but, um, yeah, it just like apparently pushed everyone enough that they couldn't hit their thirds just yeah. over literally just over the limit. Um, yeah. So. Perfect. And then, so like, you know, every, you, uh, Kira and Iris, y'all tie 505 yeah. kilos, Crazy, right? everyone on the podium ties and you win. And what ended up saving you first of all, was making a second deadlift. So deadlift. And then yeah. the, the final thing, final nail in the coffin was body weight, body weight, like I came in you, small. What a, <laughs> what a story yeah. of like your last world's your body weight kind of ruined your day and right. made it a terrible experience. And right. also like, you know, just led to like an outcome that, that was, you know, heartbreaking. And then right. here 
your right. body weight saves you and you end up winning like with right. the same total as these other two women um and and winning on body weight what an amazing like turnaround with the right. weight situation so what's funny is i did one i didn't know i won like i thought like because i didn't watch any of the third polls mm. i like was having a complete just like experience like our experience in the back like almost like my whole past four years flashing in front of my eyes between 2019 and having kids and coming back and whatever yeah. I was like bawling and like not like sad or happy just like almost like just like overwhelming yeah <laughs> you know um and then I remember Brian and Big Mike coming over and they were like you won and I was like no <laughs> wow was like, no, you won and I was like are you sure do you want to check again and I didn't know that we all tied on body weight until the award ceremony. I didn't even look at the board. Uh -huh. So I didn't know uh -huh. everyone had the same total until we were getting on the podium. That's amazing. And I was uh, like, oh my God. That, that was, I'm glad you told that because that was, I, I would have probably forgot to give such short, such bad memory. But um, I wanted to ask about that, like how it feels to be in the warm up room because Iris pulled before you. So you, you already knew like where she was, um, yeah. and, and then, but it was really just Kira who was right. pulling to, so you know, I also finish. didn't know that. Like I thought, um, Sarah was pulling to win too. And I think Sarah she's Naldi. probably, yeah. And she didn't, but I no, thought yeah, she, she was in my head. So I kind of had no idea what was going on, I guess is what I'm saying. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, Sarah Naldi was pulling for just to make 500, but yeah. Um, so you didn't know, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. And you were just kind of in your own bubble. Like you, you just explained it. So you nailed it. Yeah. But, um, but, um, yeah, I'm always curious about that because it's different. Like we all see when someone hits their third deadlift for the win and like, just like screaming and like, yeah, I'm the winner. Right. It's a little different when you win in the warm up room, you know, yeah, it's weird. someone yeah. else missed and then you're in the warm up room. And then I, I just like w the way you just describe it is so perfect. And I mean, like, that's exactly why, like, I have to be there because we don't have any footage of this. We don't have this like right. moment. And I remember Delaney had the same thing because Ina tried to like pull and beat him, um, in the 83s. And he had told this similar kind of harrowing story. He's in the, he, but he was watching the TV and he was on his knees, like praying. And I'm just like, we, we gotta have footage of this. Like, this is, this is like what makes the sport, you know? So yeah, I can't wait yeah. to be there for those moments this time. Um, but anyway, you got the world championship, got the dub and, um, the rest is history from there. Um, we already talked about PA Nats this year. We already talked about Brooklyn and Australia, so we don't need to recap anything else is there anything else about south africa that you want to mention that you haven't talked about before um i don't i don't i don't think so yeah you've told the story you know? a few times this yeah. was a good one you you told it really well this time so i'm glad <laughs> i'm glad it's worth making you uh, retell it in the think about two, it again two hours deep into this um and you know you can now put it out of your head and, and just yeah I think you know. it was the experience I needed. And I know that a lot of people would agree with me on this. that like, know me and definitely Kelly agrees with me that like, I needed this experience to feel like I like deserve to be an athlete again. Do you know what I mean? Like I, that I, I could be strong again, you know, like it was kind of like the turning point. And obviously it shows a lot in my numbers after world, um, and like my training momentum after worlds of, I started being more active in the process and being a more active participant in like the journey of my powerlifting. Um, whereas before I was just kind of doing it, Yeah, you know, because it was familiar um, or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's made the past year be so I think obviously I've seen a lot of success this past year in terms of my numbers growing, but also like a lot more enjoyable um, as well. And like a lot more enjoyable in the process. Um, and like, I'm not forcing anything. Whereas before I feel like I was trying to force a lot in training. Cause I felt like I had something to prove. Yeah. And now I feel like I don't have anything to prove, you know? Yeah. Um, so you got world champion next to your name now, and no one can ever take that away. And so, yeah, exactly. Like everyone else, if they have anything to say, it's like, they can talk to the gold medal. Uh, <laughs> <right? laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Uh, um, but yeah, I mean, that's so interesting. Cause I mean, like you're obviously so accomplished in sports and all your background and, and everything. Um, it just goes to show people that, that even these athletes like yourself, who we put on a pedestal and look at as like superheroes and stuff, you had a lot of self-doubt, um, about whether you even belonged, whether like you, your yeah. identity as an athlete and everything yep. going into this. And then 
like you said, and then it just goes to show like how, how mental, the mental side is so important because your numbers after that have yes. just shot through the roof. Yeah. And that's with that yeah. belief behind yes. the training. My, my identity with the sport and with myself, like after having kids, like I basically had an identity crisis, you know, and it took a long time to figure out and like sort through like what every, each part was going to look like and what the sport meant to me. Cause it was different. Um, but once I did, it's like very evident because I just started enjoying training a lot more. I started seeing success on and off the platform, um, you know, um, yeah. And not that anything before that was wrong, right? Because I think I had to go through that. But like, it was, there were parts that were very tough. Yeah. You know, and I felt like, why am I doing this type of deal? Um, and sometimes I was enjoying it. Sometimes I wasn't, but I also wasn't enjoying not training and not competing. Yeah. So it was a weird spot. That is weird. And that's, yeah. I mean, I'm, uh, thank God, like, like the, you know, the, in the chaos of the whole world and everything like that, you found this path and you ended up on this path and here we are today. Um, and I remember coming out of worlds, um, a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of speculation, like we're talking about maybe the Celine coming over and challenging you mm -hmm. at nationals and, um, other people, you know, talking about possibly like cutting down to yeah. 63 and coming over and trying to challenge. Yeah. And, um, there's a lot of talk, you know, on other podcasts and whatnot. And yeah. I've definitely been in the DMS with people like, championing Meg Scanlon is the one, um, because <laughs> I just look at these numbers. I'm like five Oh five with, with no bench, you know, with, with basically just getting your opener and then with your squad and, you know, just being in knowing that your training was not even a year in at that point, yeah. adults, you know, and it was yeah. going to go up from there. So, and then I, you, yeah, you me right I do yeah, right. I joke around a lot, but I just think like in reality, like I'm just very like self I'm very self-aware, but like very self to care of where I am now. Like yeah. I just am very confident of where I am now. And like, I'm cool with it. Do you know what I mean? So like, I yeah. welcome the competition and like, I will forever bet on myself. Yeah. But if the day comes and the day will sometimes come, cause it always does that someone beats me, like that's okay. Cause I'm very confident with what I'm going to bring on yeah. every single platform, you know? And, and, and on that topic, do you think you're going to go like full on Dave Ricks lift until you're 60 and going through the masters and all that stuff. I mean, at this point, yeah. as <laughs> no, of I'm today, saying, I got a long way to go. I know. I, I, yeah, I've said this before, but like, I got a long way to go to, you know, even like, I always think of like Jen Thompson, right? Like yeah. she, one of the idols and I got into sports. So one of my idols, one of the nicest people ever love her, love her husband. Like, yeah, there's, you know, like she's as a female, like with two now grown children basically yeah. Yeah. still competing still hitting prs still getting better like that's amazing yeah. you know because there are so many phases in life and um each one brings its own challenges but there can be a constant right and she's shown that like yeah you know like you can constantly power lift if you choose to and do it at a high level and continue to get better she's going to be 50 you yeah, know, like, she's still PR. I think she PR'd her total like a couple of times total. in the last couple of years. Yeah. So, right. So like, that's incredible. And for me, like that's another 15 years. Yeah. And so if like, anyone can do that, it's you for sure. Like you're, you know? you're built for it. Like you're the athlete, you're that athletic type, like, and, um, you know, you're jacked and like, you're, you're definitely, you're you can jacked. do it. You can do it. Yeah. Yeah. I think the most dangerous part and by dangerous, I mean that in a good way is like, I'm having fun right now. Yeah. So like, and that's usually when I perform the best. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So look out world. All right. Um, <laughs> I, got, I got a couple of question. I want one last topic that I wanted to bring up um, just because mm -hmm. you're like, so uniquely situated to answer this question um, is about women coaching in powerlifting. And mm -hmm. um, it comes from a conversation I had with someone at high school nationals being in the warm up room and just noticing that there weren't very many women coaches. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking back to, um, PA Nats in Austin, I was thinking about you, Natalie Richards and Susie Gary. Um, as far as I can recall off the top of my head, were the only three women coaches, um, like I said, uh, Claire's eye was there competing and she's a mm -hmm. coach as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't think that she was coaching anyone at the meet, but yeah. So, well, why is it that there 
do first of all, do you think there are enough women coaches in, in the sport in, you know, like in these high levels, uh, what challenges there are, um, for women coaches. And like, I guess the question is like all three of those examples that I named you, Natalie and Susie Gary are like elite level athletes, like, like, you know, world-class Susie obviously is like, you know, yeah. however many billion time world. Legend. Champion. Yeah. Um, and like, do you, do you have to be like a elite level athlete to, to be a, a good coach or to get a uh, recognition as being a good coach on the women's side? Cause I think on the men's side, we see all the time, like there's a lot of coaches that don't necessarily have elite level totals and things like this. And they're heralded as the best coach, you know, best thing since sliced bread. So yeah, go yeah. ahead. It's big, a big topic. Um, it so is a big topic. Th- what's your thoughts? It's one, on it? it's one that I, it's funny that you asked this one. I get, I get spicy a lot about Paul. Um, so here's, yeah, I could go attack this in a couple of different angles. Do I think that you should have to be a big athlete to have a coaching roster as a female? No, absolutely not. You should not have to, because coaching should not have to do with your athletic career at all. It's a totally different thing, right? I happened to get in power into powerlifting because I was a strength coach. So I was already within that realm that can go either way for people. Some people will end up being a coach because they fall in love with the sport. And some people will be a coach first and then fall in love with the sport. Right. Um, but that was just how I ended up getting into powerlifting. Um, and a lot of the other female coaches that are well-known it's because they are also strong. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Unfortunately, strength sports is an objective thing. And a lot of people sometimes have the mindset, well, if they're not stronger than me, then how are they going to coach me type of deal? Yeah. Exactly. Unfortunately, um, do I think it should be that way? No, I absolutely don't. Cause I think there's a lot of smart, very smart individuals that make incredible coaches that aren't necessarily the strongest in the world. Yeah. Um, I, I do think that, and this isn't specific to powerlifting, but in strength, the strength coaching world in general, it is, um, harder as a female, because this is the best way I can describe it. I feel like as a male, and this has nothing to do like against males, but it's just like, yeah natural tendency as a male you walk into the room and like you already have the respect if you're a strength coach you don't necessarily have to prove anything right like people are going to take your word and kind of believe it whether they should or not whereas a female you you have to prove yourself yeah. and your knowledge not talking athlete like your knowledge about strength it should be the same for both like you shouldn't take anyone just because they're saying anything um i do think it's starting to change and i've seen it change a lot like i've been in the strength world now since i was 20 so 15 yeah. years, it's changed significantly. And I think it's something that's changing even quicker now because of social media. And that's very cool. Yeah. Um, I think that there, some of the reason we see more male coaches that aren't necessarily at the elite level is that, and this is just whatever, I think males have a tendency to be a little bit more confident in putting themselves out there. Right. Yeah. So that's yeah. a thing that as females, we have to be better at, you know, like yeah. putting content out there. Right. Um, for instance, I know you mentioned like Steve DeNovi, not to throw him under the bus, but doesn't have like an elite total, has yeah. a very elite roster. He puts yeah. great information out there, right? Mm-hmm. A lot, there's a lot of male coaches like that. There's not that many female coaches like that. My coach, mm-hmm. Kelly, throw her under the bus. She doesn't have an elite powerlifting total, but she puts out a lot of great content. So that's yeah. why she had my trust. Like I was bought in before she knew I was bought in because I did my research, right? Mm-hmm the, uh, the information that she's put out. So I think that it's something that's changing a lot. And I hope that it continues to change. Um, because I think that there's probably a lot of very, very knowledgeable female coaches out there that don't necessarily, that people don't know about. Yeah. Yeah. Because they don't have a platform. They don't have the thing. Yeah, exactly. They don't have being an elite athlete gives you a a platform already to present to you don't have to build the platform. Like people that don't have that have to build their platform. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, and and I think like, um, there's like a saying, it's like, if only I had the confidence of like a mediocre white man. Um, And you know, like that, that you could put yourself out there and just like start to blow up your following and stuff like this. Um, and maybe there's a thing where women, like you said, don't put themselves out there as much. And Mm -hmm. that's one reason why. And then also, like you said, um, it's harder to crack in if you don't have like an elite athlete, like now Kelly has you, you know, and I don't know who, who are other athletes, I guess, uh, Brittany Saplicki is one as well. 
Yeah. Um, then she, like, she coaches a bunch of athletes, like in different countries. She's a lot of yeah. athletes. Um, and yeah. she does coach on um, Liz Craven in Australia, who's like, again, like another legend. Yeah. Um, she has a lot of male athletes too, that are international. Um, and a few that are going to worlds, but again, similarly though, like I yeah. found her via social media and then was able to look at all of the information she has put out. So like, I'm choosing her because of her knowledge and she's, the reason I know that is because she's put it out there. Yeah. So like, it's something that's starting to happen more. It's just similar to how there wasn't that many females in powerlifting 10 years ago. Yeah. Now there's a ton. It's almost 50, 50, if not yeah. 50, 50. Right. Totally, totally. Um, so it's just like something that like it's changing, but it takes a little while. Yeah. And the women are killing it. Like we saw at Sheffield, they broke way more world records than the men. Um, I think some of the most exciting battles in the world, um, are in the women weight, the women's weight classes. Some of the most elite athletes are in the women's weight classes. So it's definitely changing, but yeah. Did you, were you, um, when you hired Kelly, were you looking specifically to hire a woman or were you just looking for any coach? No, I mean, I, I wouldn't say I was looking for any coach. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, but gender um, wasn't a, yeah, a sure. Sure. So once, when I first reached out to her, like I wasn't really looking for a coach at all. And then when I started to think about powerlifting and was thinking about a coach, gender was not a factor. Gotcha. Like I, I had a, you know, say like three or four coaches in mind and was kind of like, like I was saying, reviewing information they've put out, what their philosophies are, trying to get a feel of like their personality. Um, yeah. Cause like, that's important, you know, totally. like that your personalities meld, especially where I'm at like now. Um, so it was a couple of different factors. Um, and for me, obviously I had the advantage of, I got to know her a little bit through our one-on-one sessions. And like, I knew personality wise that it was going to be a great fit. And I also knew that she was very smart. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> so. it's, you know, hindsight's 2020. It's obvious now. I mean, I, yeah. she's like one of the, she's a star coach now. Um, and what she's done with you is like just amazing. Um, do as a coach, do you have, do you find that you mostly attract women as clients or do you also have men as well? I do have men, um, but I for sure have more female clients. Okay. Um, I, it, yeah, it is what it is, right? It I mean, is what it is. Yeah. I don't exactly. know how else to say that. Um, I have male clients and it, they're great. And I know that they respect me and my knowledge, but that's the thing. They respect me and my knowledge. I think that sometimes it's again, harder for males to necessarily trust a female coach. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And again, I'm not like, this isn't like, I'm not, thinking, right? it just kind of is what it is. Like it's a change. And I think it's something that is changing. Yeah. Right. Um, I think sometimes as females, we also put ourselves in the position to accept only like females. Whereas like, why shouldn't we accept males as well? You know, like, mm-hmm. yeah, we are I also mean, able to coach males, you know, like, obviously, I mean, it's, right. But it, you know, you know, like, um, sometimes we, we, as females even limit ourselves to that, right? Like only accepting some, some women coaches will only accept females. Um, it's like accept males and females. Like it is about knowledge. Like the coaching is about knowledge and feel, and it's yeah. about the right fit. Not every coach is going to be perfect for everybody. And you just don't know when you're going to find that right fit. And when you do, it makes a big difference, you know? Yeah. Unfortunately, I think yeah. a lot of people, men, men in particular, um, hire coaches just based off of like social media, like accolades and following yeah. and, um, how strong they were as a lifter and stuff. And um, I think, I do think a lot of men don't even consider hiring women as coaches. Um, I think they mostly just, you know, will just look laser focus on dudes and that's that, but it's starting to hopefully, you know, change a little bit. I think when we start to see like super high level athletes, like on world's teams and stuff mm-hmm. like this, win with women as their head, mm-hmm. as their personal coaches, that'll mm-hmm. be a big game changing thing. Cause we obviously see women coaching like yourself and other women mm-hmm. um, out there. So it's changing on the women's side. It's interesting. Powerlifting is more advanced in some ways than a lot of other sports, like, like women coaches in, a, like in, in football, for instance, are like right. just now starting to get like low level, uh, coaching yep. positions and stuff right. like this and powerlifting. I mean, even if the numbers now they're like 50, 50, but even when yeah. they weren't right. 50, 50% of the gold medals go to women, like it, because of the right. weight class and the, you know, the, the, um, male and female divisions, it's like, you still have like equal amount of time on the podium as the male mm-hmm. counterparts, which is different in a lot of sports. Um, yes. because we have an equal uh, number yeah. of weight classes for men and women. So, 
Um, it's interesting that how powerlifting can be, you know, it's like, it could be a little bit behind the times in some ways, but I think on this thing, it, on this uh, question, it's like a little bit ahead of the curve as far as other mainstream sports. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, it's way more of an even playing field, male, female, than most sports out there, you know? Um, I think strength sports in general is such a rapid area of growth for females, both competing, but also as coaching, as coaches, yeah. um, even being like a, so like in school, like I wanted to be a strength and conditioning coach, like at a college, right? Like mm -hmm. at the time that was kind of like, there wasn't that many females doing that in general, right? Like male yeah. dominated, that has vastly changed. Like there are a lot of things that are changing. Um, and I think that it is something that will continue to change in the sport of any strength sport, but in the sport of powerlifting as well. Um, so For sure. yeah, Kelly Mann's hopefully, you know, after you run it back to back world championships, um, you know, mm -hmm. hopefully her e inbox is just flooded. Everyone wants to hire her. I know people ask me about coaching recommendations. I always mention her name as well. Um, all right. So let's do some quick hitters. Um, and we'll wrap this up like here in just like five minutes. Um, first one was, where did you grow up? I grew up in Massachusetts in a town outside of Boston. What town is it? Melrose. Oh, Melrose. All right. Yeah. What was, oh. <laughs> I don't know about it, but you know, you know, Melrose place, like, I mean, I'm old. Oh yeah. Um, okay. I'm like, Ooh, sounds cool. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> what was your first sport? Uh, gymnastics. Okay. When did you start that? I was little. Yeah. Super like young. two or three. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you, yeah, started, pretty little. Holy cow. yeah. So your parents got you involved in sports super young. Yeah. I, I did funny. like all types of sports, but that was one that stuck. I did that for a long time, like till I was like in high school. Okay. Okay. That yeah. explains it. Um, when you're not doing powerlifting, what would be an ideal, like weekend getaway from you for you? Like what's your idea of a good time? Definitely. It would include the beach. Okay. That was yeah. another question is beaches or mountains. So we we'll take beaches, huh? I would take the beach. Yeah. All mountains right. are great, but I would take the beach. All right. Awesome. Um, do you have a nickname? Girl. I uh, feel like nothing cool. Uh, like Meg. <laughs> Meg. Yeah. Meg Jan. So I had a cool nickname in college. I played soccer in college and all of my teammates called me SJ because at the time it was the Olympics, like say 2008 Olympics or whatever, probably dating myself, but 2008 Olympics and Sean Johnson was competing Oh yeah. and yeah. they thought I looked like her. So that's how okay. I got my nickname. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. My sister was a university level gymnast and I remember Sean Johnson. Yep. Um, <clears throat> who's a person that you look up to in powerlifting? Um, I mean, I've definitely always, um, like looked up to Jen Thompson, like from the beginning, like, I just feel like she was such a huge impact on female powerlifting for such a long period of time. Um, I mean, she's been around since there was probably two females out of powerlifting meet until yeah. now and she still has is competitive and a dominating force so like that's super cool um and i also always like looked up to kim walford from the beginning yeah she was a powerhouse like when i started it was like oh my gosh are you kidding i remember yeah. going to orlando in the first national just to see her deadlift oh yeah yeah room on fire do you know yeah. what i mean yeah. on fire incredible She's so um amazing. i would say those are like my first two like powerlifting idols I haven't met Jen Thompson. I've only heard amazing things. And I met Kimberly in Panama and she's just, she lives up to all the hype and all the accolades and she just does everything. And I think Jen does too, but like, um, Kimberly, you know, she was coaching a team. She was refing. She was like in the chair. She was doing technical. Uh, she was like the technical controller for one day. Mm -hmm. And then she was also organizing stuff for yeah. USBI. Like she's big, um, running that federation behind the scenes and whatnot. So it's like, very, yeah, very cool to see a person like that be elite level on the platform and, volunteer. And, and off the platform. Yeah. They definitely both do that. And I think that's something yeah. that's very understated, um, you know, and like that's it, how much effort it also takes to do that and compete. Totally. Totally. Um, all right. What's your favorite sport to watch? Hmm. I mean, I like to watch football. Okay. Nice. But UFC too. Oh, perfect. Awesome. What's your favorite football team then? I mean, the Patriots. But they, oh, they shit, I right forgot. Now. <laughs> oh, yeah. You grew up in Massachusetts. You got to be. Yeah. I grew up in a great era of Boston sports. That's awesome. That's a lot awesome. of championships. Yeah. Yeah. The baseball team, yeah. too, man. Yeah. That's great. Um, so, if you were going to say, like, what's your favorite team as a whole? It's a Patriots, or is it, would it be Red Sox or? I would something? say the Patriots. 
Oh God, yeah. you were there for Kevin Garnett and the Celtics as well. Mm-hmm. So like you, yep. Paul it was Pierce great. And all those. It was Damn, great. Those are good little moments. A there. lot of parades for a while there. Yeah. Um, what is your favorite music genre? Ooh, okay. Um, probably like, you know, 2000, 2010, like hip hop, rap, pop. Awesome. That's exactly what I like as well. Uh, I'm writing it down. Um, and who's your favorite rapper? Um, hmm. My favorite artist or specifically rapper? You can say your favorite artist and then you can say your favorite rapper. All right. Well, my favorite artist is definitely Beyonce. Hands awesome. down. I haven't been to many concerts, but I'm pretty sure I've been to three Beyonce. That's awesome. I've never seen her live. Really? It's amazing. No. I highly recommend it. It's life yeah. changing. No. Um, okay. My favorite rapper. Hmm. I don't know. Who is the first name that came to your mind just now? I don't know. <laughs> I'm torn. Cause I do like some rap music, like current rap music too. You know what I mean? Yes. So who's your favorite current rapper? I mean, like Drake is a good rapper. Yeah, Drake. Everyone. I feel like that's a cop out answer, but like it's not. You know. it's, it's, what's what you really like? And then who? It's, it's, yeah. And then like, this is not going to be a popular answer, but if you could take like, can you take a person out of his rapping like Kanye? Yeah. yeah, yeah Do you know obviously. what I mean? Of course. I uh, grew up, uh, I grew up with Kanye, and I still listen to his albums all the time. But they're yeah, obviously phenomenal. Political beliefs and whatnot, you got to separate yourself from for sure. Of course, Kanye. Yeah, like he's like one of the goats. His albums from back in the day are really. Sometimes yeah. you go back and listen to them, and you're like, wow. And also, have you ever watched the documentary? Not to get too off topic, but the documentary, the Kanye documentary. I have that People legitimately keep... his friend filmed back yeah. in the day. It's incredible. You should probably watch. I it. know. I'm definitely going to watch it. It's been a little bittersweet with Kanye lately. I gotta say, I know. I've kind of just like tried because because I actually like love him so much. I, yeah. Like, I grew up like it, you know that was my the that downfall was my era. has been rough. The downfall has been very rough. So I've been trying, I will watch it though at some point, but um, it's also incredible how many other in- names, like yeah. huge rappers of the time are in this documentary. And you're yeah. just like, oh wow, you all existed in the same era. Yeah. At exactly. the same time. He comes from the Jay-Z tree, you know? So, yeah. so, you know, um, there's a lot there. Okay. Um, another last, last one is uh movie genres and favorite movie. So mm. like, if you guys, if you're having a debate with Brian about what, what type of movie to watch, what, what's your genre of choice? Oh, mine is definitely always going to be comedy. Okay. Always. What's Brian's? He wants to watch like a scary movie. Slasher. He likes, he likes I don't want to watch a scary movie. Are you kidding me? I want a comedy. Uh, <laughs> I mean, my favorite movie of all time has been the same since I was like in fifth grade and I should probably update it, but what was it? What whatever. It? Billy Madison. Oh my God. That's amazing. I love old school Adam Sandler movies. No wonder we get along so well. I mean, I used to be able to like, when I was in high school, I could quote like every single line of Billy Madison. Mm -hmm. Um, Billy Madison, Happy Gilmore. Oh, I had them both on VHS. Um, But both of those are amazing. I thought you were going to say, because I copy and paste the notes for this from previous and um, Dana McNeil's favorite movie of all time. I think it was Dana McNeil um, was Little Mermaid. Oh God, really? That's hilarious. Um, was it Dana McNeil or was it someone else? I think it was Dana. Yeah. Uh, Little Mermaid. And you. When you were saying that you were like remembering oh, yeah. uh, since you were five years old, I was like, here we go. It's Little Mermaid again. Little Mermaid. That's hilarious. Billy Madison is the say, last thing I expected. I got to say, like, now that I'm rewatching some of the Disney movies because of children, they got some hits, man. I forgot yeah. what some of these movies were like, but also terribly sad and a little yeah. scary. Yeah, At times. yeah, a little disturbing actually. <laughs> yeah, watching yeah. them as adults, like the implications yeah. of a lot of this stuff, yeah. like murders yeah. and yeah. Like mobs and like lynch mobs and stuff. Yeah, it's like it's mm-hmm. it's wild. Um, but yeah, all right. Well, that's everything I have for you, Meg. Um, thank you so much Perfect. for joining me on this. Um, like we went super long here, but like there's so much great stuff in there. You gave tons of great sound bites, and you have such a great attitude. You're a great role model, mom, athlete everything so um really appreciate appreciate you coming on thanks for having me all right 
All right. Well, with that, we will uh, wrap. Oh, sorry. I always forget to That's ask right. this. Is there anyone you want to oh, thank? Right. Any sponsors you want to shout out? Any Anyone else you want to thank? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, definitely thank my coach, Kelly. She's been great. She's like helped me back into the sport in so many ways. Um, also SBD. Um, I mean, personally, they've supported me a lot, but they support the sport so much in general. Um, and I think, again, that's something that goes unnoticed, um, how much that they give back to the sport and are helping grow it. So as an athlete, I appreciate that tremendously. And I am also excited to watch it unfold yeah. and shuffle to come. Yeah, same here. I mean, hats off, Chef, uh, SBD. They right? do so much, and I'm gonna. When I see Kelly, I'm definitely gonna give her a hug. I'm in Malta uh, because, like, she's helping. You know, I don't know. It's like a interesting. If if Kelly didn't exist, would Meg Scanlon be? Would we be doing a hundred percent no? Today? You That's know? a no. So yeah, exactly. We owe her um, a five star <laughs> meal, a couple of whatever her favorite adult beverages are, some hugs, <laughs> everything. So Team USA definitely has to respect Kelly. All right, Meg. Well, that's it for today. And um, thank you again for joining us and everything. And then thanks to everyone that listens to the Powerlifting America podcast. With that, we're out of here. Peace.